Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is George Lopez, and I have the great privilege of serving as the vice president here at USIP for the Academy for International Conflict Management and Peacebuilding. The Academy traditionally has been the teaching and training and education wing of USIP. Uh, we've undergone a recent strategic plan in which we told our colleagues we don't like being a wing. We want to be central to the heart blood. So now our, our new self-description and language is we want to be at the heart blood and heartbeat of what goes on in some of the more intractable disputes that demand training, education, and various other kinds of discussion. Uh, one of the reasons we're so delighted to be here with SIL, our friends at Alliance for Peacebuilding and the Center for Applied Linguistics is we think this issue is one that's at the heart of tough training, negotiation, education, and building a world of greater peace. So on behalf of all of us associated with the United States Institute of Peace, we welcome you and we're delighted to be your hosts. Before I turn it over to Melanie for her opening, uh, let me do a couple of logistics. Uh, if you have one of those beeping devices in your pocketbook or on your person. Uh, be good to turn it off to silent mode if you would. Uh, it'd be good not to have you being paged for an international crisis resolution during a very important moment of presentation. Um, you see the schedule, we'll have a break a little uh, later down the road, about half time of our day after the first exciting panel. But if you need uh, to, to leave for a moment, there are exits here at the bottom which goes to your right quickly and, and brings you out at a, at a different wing, but it brings you out uh, on the way to restrooms and particularly in the back, you would go and go around the stairway which you came down and restrooms are around behind that stairway. Uh, if you have other needs, we have some folks at the back who can help you if you'd like. But again, welcome here. Uh, we uh, love doing events in this building, in this room, and it's great to have a collection of you who may not have before visited the United States Institute of Peace. Now I'd like to introduce our friend and colleague, the President and CEO of the Alliance for Peacebuilding, probably one of the greatest forces in this town for networking, for creativity, for doing great studies that keeps the peacebuilding theme alive. Melanie Greenberg, President and CEO of the Alliance. Well, thank you, George, and thanks to all of you. It is such a great honor to be here and to co-sponsor this very creative and integrated conference. Um, I want to thank SIL International, the Center for Applied Linguistics, and USIP, and it's been such a wonderful collaboration already, just thinking about the conference, and very much look forward to hearing all of your views and what comes out today. Uh, the Alliance for Peacebuilding is a membership organization of more than 80 peacebuilding organizations, uh, over 1,000 professionals, and 15,000 people in our network and on our mailing list. So I encourage all of you who have an interest in peace and language to join, either as an organization or as members, so we can continue this conversation. So why is the conference being held today on February 21st? Today, I'm sure most of you in this room realize, I actually hadn't until we started planning the conference, that today is the United Nations International Mother Language Day. And the International Mother Language Day annually celebrates language and cultural diversity worldwide. On International Mother Language Day, UNESCO and other UN agencies encourage events that promote linguistic and cultural diversity, while also encouraging people to maintain knowledge of their mother language or mother tongue. Uh, mother tongue education is promoted, as is the use of more than one language. And International Mother Language Day was born out of the remembrance of four university students who died on February 21st, 1952, as they campaigned to officially use their own mother language, Bengali, in Bangladesh. So today's conference on language, peace, and security explores the role of language, both as a means of communication, as an expression of identity, a vital consideration for any serious discussion of peace and security, as I know all of you have experienced in your own peace building work. The roundtable today will look at the overlooked linguistic and educational dimensions of a complex peace building process in Asia. We'll address the importance of ensuring linguistic human rights through educational policy and practices that value and promote linguistic diversity. We'll consider language policy and education and how it might serve to exacerbate or to mitigate violence. We'll think about how the careful consideration of language and communications in discussions of peace and security 
lead to real, con real solutions to conflict? And how do issues of language and language and complexity play out in peace building efforts and ongoing security? And I come to these issues very much not only from professional experience, from personal experience, that in my journey as a peace builder, I started as an exchange student in high school through the experiment in international living. And part of the training at that time was two weeks in a New England town where you looked uh, very holistically at language and culture and how they come together. There was immersive language, but also thinking about how you read the subtler linguistic signs and cultural signs of people, uh, not always in conflict, but in cultures other than our own. Um, I was hooked at that point at seeing the connections between culture and language and went on to be a comparative literature major in college, very interested in questions of narrative, how people tell stories. And then as I went through law school and entered the field of peace building, one of my first experiences in a citizen level track two or track one and a half diplomacy was in the conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh, where Armenia, Azerbaijan, and the enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh citizens came together to think about a more peaceful future moving forward. So the languages being used in the room were Armenian, the Armenians and many in Nagorno-Karabakh, Azerbaijani from refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh and the Azerbaijanis, Russian, which at that time was the lingua franca for the Azerbaijanis and Armenians, and English, which is the language of the facilitators and people putting on this peace, helping organize this peace process. And so seeing when people use these languages was fascinating because each group on its own would speak with this in its own groups and their own languages, but then each side would be upset at the other because they didn't understand what was being whispered. They could speak together in Russian, but Russian was really tainted in many ways because this was the first couple of years after the breakup of the Soviet Union where they were bound together by this language but no longer by the ideas of this, of this empire. Um, and it actually came to a head when the Armenians asked the um, Azerbaijanis for an apology for the Turkish genocide. And the Azerbaijanis said, but we're not Turkish. Our language is Turkic. We are not Turkish. And this is a whole other long story, but in the end, the Armenians recognized kind of the pain, uh, the Azerbaijanis recognized the pain that the Armenians had gone through, but it was an area where language played such a key role and then also the problematic issue of English as being the peace building language and what it meant for these groups to be working in a kind of Western peace building framework. So as I come to the conference today, those conversations are really ringing in my ears and I know that all of you will bring your own experiences to the round table today. And I wanna thank you all again for coming and to turn the floor back over to George for our first panel. Thank you. Melanie, thank you for getting us off to such a smart start. Thank you. If I invite our uh, first set of panel presenters, um, we have a day that's just so smartly divided between keynote presentations in this first set of panels and then a grassroots panel, as it's called. Uh, the panel this afternoon will be moderated by my colleague, Peter Weinberger. Um, this afternoon, we have the privilege, as you'll see from the bios in your uh, in, in your program of some people who've been spending uh, most of their life on some of these key questions. We're not going to give long introductions to anyone, but say that our, our beginning presentation is a joint presentation by uh, Patricia Friedrich and Terence Wiley, followed by a presentation by Zina Zakaria, and then the concluding presentation by Dr. Soe Lee, uh, Lai, excuse me. Um, I think if, if our timing goes well here, what we can do is do the, do, do the three presentations together. Uh, I'll share very briefly some, some observations, but we really would like some audience participation and Q&A after that. So uh, thank you very much for your participation as listeners at the start. I turn the uh, presentation over to our first two good presenters. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the Institute, uh, SIL, and also the Alliance uh, for co-sponsoring this event with us. Uh, at the Center for Applied Linguistics, we have a long history of working on issues of trying to improve uh, communication through language learning and better understanding of culture. So this event uh, really resonates with the work that we do. 
Um, I'm also here in, in the sense that uh, I've spent a lot of my uh, academic career working on issues uh, related to language rights, language policies, uh, and the history of some of the uh, both tolerance and intolerance that we find uh, around the world and in, in even in this country. I'm just curious, uh, this doesn't necessarily look like an audience of sports fans, but I'm sure there's some out there. I heard someone asking about the hockey game a little while ago. Um, how many of you saw the commercial during the uh, Super Bowl that was the Coca-Cola ad? Right. And uh, you noted the reaction that occurred the next day in the United States, which prides itself in terms of uh, celebrating freedom. Uh, that so many people seem to be offended by the fact that uh, America the Beautiful might be sung in languages other than English. And so uh, we don't have to look too far, uh, even around uh, our own country, to find that linguistic intolerance is something fairly deeply ingrained. Now, as was just mentioned, um, this, this day actually commemorates a tragic event uh, that occurred uh, in East Pakistan before it was separated into Bangladesh. And in fact, the event helped to trigger the founding of Bangladesh. Uh, one of the common ideologies uh, that's very popular in not only this country, but you can go to France or you can go to other countries, and there's a strong belief that's deeply ingrained in many people that to have a nation that you need only one language, and that in fact one language promotes national unity. In the case of uh, East Pakistan and the imposition of Urdu there, uh, it was a demonstration of the fact that when you don't acknowledge uh, languages that are uh, in the population and uh, spoken uh, widely in the population, that promoting only one language can in fact trigger uh, violence. We also know that there are places uh, where a common language is spoken and yet uh, the countries are torn apart. For how many years were there problems in Northern Ireland where English was widely spoken even though Irish existed as a minority language? That was over primarily religious conflict. But uh, a common language doesn't always guarantee in fact that there is going to be unity. So, uh, you know, uh, this particular day is, is uh, marked to commemorate a tragedy. And uh, I think we don't have to look far around the world right now to see the amount of ethnic and civil conflict that's going on in many societies all over the world right now. Another incident uh, that uh, uh, some of you may uh, have a little more familiar in your memory as the uh, incident in 1976, the Soweto uh, uprising, where um, African uh, students were protesting the use of Afrikaans being imposed upon them as a language of instruction and without the right uh, to be able to speak uh, their own languages. And uh, this is another very vivid example of where uh, language repression was actually the spark that, that uh, ultimately helped to bring down uh, apartheid and uh, bring in Mandela. Uh, today, uh, the, the South African uh, Constitution recognizes 11 languages, and uh, that's largely a result of, of some of the intolerance that had preceded it. There are lesser known uh, incidents that were not entirely about language, but had a linguistic uh, side to them. Uh, in the picture on the uh, right that's in color, uh, this is a park in Taipei, uh, Taiwan, that commemorates an incident that is ingrained very deeply in the local population's memory there. Shortly uh, after World War II, when uh, Chiang Kai-shek's armies were defeated on the mainland, uh, they, uh, they went uh, to Taiwan to uh, basically take refuge and set up the, uh, uh, the Republic of China there. And uh, shortly thereafter, um, there was a, a lot of tension between the local population and the incoming population from the mainland. And some of this involved uh, economic rivalry and the rights to uh, certain types of uh, ability to sell products and so forth. 
Um, there was also, the population was in quite a predicament because uh, they had been under rule from Japan for 50 years as a colony of Japan and Japanese had been the imposed language. And then with little time to make the transition, they were required to shift to Mandarin. And there was uh, uh, an uprising. Uh, a lot of it was economically motivated, but some of it was also linguistically motivated because people were automatically becoming functionally illiterate overnight, having to make this rapid switch. Uh, estimates are that between 10 and 30,000 people were killed. Uh, in the 1980s, I met an elderly woman from Taiwan who told me that her husband had disappeared at that time and she had never seen him since. And uh, in the older population, these stories are still there. So, uh, you know, these are just several examples uh, internationally of where we've had uh, linguistic intolerance. If we come back to this country, uh, we find a very mixed history. I've just recently completed a rather lengthy article on this uh, topic that will be published in a few weeks in Review of Research and Education. Uh, we have examples of tolerance, uh, linguistic tolerance in the United States, but in the 19th century, in the 1880s, we have one of the more vivid examples of intolerance, where uh, Native Americans were uh, required, the children were required to go into boarding schools, and uh, the boarding schools uh, persisted in the United States until the 1960s. So in those schools, uh, Native children were not allowed to use uh, their native languages and uh, they, they were uh, not able to visit their families and so forth. About three decades later, during World War I, we had one of the, uh, the wide, most widespread uh, uh, sequences of linguistic intolerance by the end of World War I. A year later, in 1919, uh, 34 states had passed laws not only endorsing English, but prohibiting the use of foreign language instruction in schools. And I think one of the reasons that we still have difficulty promoting foreign language instruction today is the legacy that we, we still have with us as a result of that period that was sparked by war and intolerance at a time when a substantial portion of the United States spoke German. So I've had to present the uh, sad side of the story, and uh, I brought somebody along to help cheer us up a little bit on the next part. So These, by the way, are the positions that have been staked out by the United Nations uh, over uh, the years. The, the UN has uh, steadfastly backed uh, uh, linguistic human rights as well as all uh, other human rights. Uh, unfortunately, these are not binding, and so um, as a result of that, uh, member states often do not follow the uh, declarations that they have endorsed in the United Nations. So good morning. I have the uh, hard job of making everybody cheerful um, and thinking of uh, linguistics and uh, peace as very compatible. I'm actually a self-entitled peace linguist. Um, I'm also World Englishes scholar. World Englishes, like that in the plural. Uh, my computer gives me a hard time every time I write Englishes, which is several times a day. Um, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a title that we consider very important. Um, because we think of this language as many already, and so calling them world Englishes is an acknowledgement of the diversity also within the English-speaking uh, population around the world. And so um, I wanted to give you a general idea of um, where I started these works about um, peace and language and the ways that we can bring the two together. Um, and so um, if you look at this first slide, um, I can think, and, and you are welcome to uh, come up with other ways I would really like to expand this list, but I can think of three primary ways that we talk about peace and language as related. Uh, the first one is the use of a language as a vehicle for peace and communication about peace. So I'm here today and I'm using English because that's the language that we have in common to tell you something about peace. I'm using this language as a vehicle uh, to communicate ideas about peace. What, was I in a different environment? I might choose a different uh, language to be more effective. Uh, the second way is thinking of what terms of peace language itself contains. So if we do a, just a, a very brief mental recap of some of the expressions that we use on a daily basis, we'll see that we have a lot of metaphors of violence. And uh, once I just went over movie titles, for example, the ones that had 
you know, peace fostering terms as opposed to violence fostering terms. And we can look at language itself and see what terms are fostering a peace and which ones are not. But then there is a third way, and this is the one that I'm the most interested in because I'm a social linguist, um, which is the ways in which we can use language as a catalyst for peace and a catalyst for change in society. It's when we bring peace, society, and language all together. And that's, that can be a little messy because you know once we put uh, people and language together, things get complicated. And so um, I wanted to uh, refer to this um, to this uh, quote by Suresh Kanagaraja, who's a researcher that I admire very much for um, his references to uh, the classroom and it's this really powerful place um, for change. Um, and so he says, the classroom is a powerful site for, uh, of policy negotiation. The pedagogies pr practiced and texts produced in the classroom can reconstruct uh, policies ground up. In fact, the classroom is already a policy site. Every time teachers insist on a uniform variety of language or discourse, we are helping reproduce monolingualist ideologies and linguistic hierarchies. So, you know, we academics like to add beautiful uh, words there, but I think the message here is, is a simple one, that the, the classroom is a place uh, that informs and uh, uh, imagines policy in itself, right? And so I want to call, it, call your attention to several different parts of this uh, the quote. Uh, first of first, the, the most important part to me is this idea that there are varieties of language, and we've moved a little away from calling varieties of language dialects, but you might know varieties of language from that term. And the reason why we like to use the term variety so much is that it does not in itself create a hierarchy of you know, one language being superior to another or one variety being superior to the other. So we usually have a standard language that we have as a goal to be upheld, right? And in opposition to that used to be the term dialect. When we talk about varieties, you're just acknowledging that yes, language varies and it varies according to purpose and audience, but there is nothing intrinsic in the language that makes it better than another language. The, language, the reason why one language has a unique position in the world is outside of language, is of an attitudinal, a political, economic nature, but not necessarily intrinsically linguistic. Okay? Um, so let me share some assumptions of what I believe language is and language does and what teaching does in this context. So I think teaching is a political act, and I think that it's one that can peacefully counteract or address other political acts, um, some of the ones, for example, uh, Dr. Wiley was talking about. Um, I believe classrooms are sites of what we call relative autonomy. That means that they relate and they are windows to the world outside, but there are also places where students can detach a little bit from the world outside and reimagine it or, or be um, sheltered from what is happening in the outside world. I also believe that languages are fluid and democratic because we change it all the time. And there are forces of preservation in language that preserve them and, and, and uh, prescribe you know, the, your dictionaries and your grammar books and your teachers telling you not to split the infinitives. But ultimately, the force of change wins over. And we know that because we have a hard time reading Shakespeare. If the forces of change were not the ones that won over, we wouldn't need a dictionary or you know, um, a language expert to help us read Shakespeare in the original. Um, and finally, there is this concept of language ownership, the idea that uh, certain groups or certain people have greater ownership of a language than others. But in truth, language ownership is defined by those who use it. Okay? I consider English as my own, as if it were a mother tongue, even though you're probably now guessing where I'm from. Um, and uh, this, this idea of ownership being in the hands of people who use it, I think is a very important uh, concept uh, to, to bring in the classroom and to bring in policy uh, making. Now the myths. Um, language is never uniform. Even for those people who think that they speak only one language, they don't. They speak several languages. And you know this because the way you talk to a child is different from the way you talk to your boss, which is different from the way you talk to your friend. So we are making those switches all the time. 
Uh, we have varieties within varieties, and we can actually, as linguists, go down to the individual variety, which is like a fingerprint. Your variety of language is different from anybody else's because you're you. Um, in intrinsically, like I said, there is no such thing as a better language. Uh, languages intrinsically do what they're set to do in society, and they change to accommodate the needs of a society. So whether we uphold one uh, hierarchically as hierarchically superior to others is a matter attitudinal, political, but not linguistic. Um, standard language is also a non-linguistic assessment. If the game changes, what is considered the standard will also change. So a standard is not a standard forever. Okay, and so in successful communications, what we see is people gauging what the purpose and the audience are and making linguistic choices based on those rather than the other way around, okay? Now, here comes uh, the tricky part. I've been talking about all of these varieties and all of these different languages, but the fact is that a mother tongue holds, for people who have that mother tongue, a special uh, place in their hearts many times. And their identity is also mediated by the language that they speak, and their sense of human dignity is too. And so acts of violence against languages reflect very seriously on a person's sense of identity. And we see some of these um, events happening in many ways because that respect was not there. And finally, when you engage with other languages, if you are a multilingual person, that does not necessarily mean that you have displaced or misplaced the mother tongue. You can still uphold the mother tongue you know, in all of its dignity and include other languages as additional languages. Okay? So we can't discard the role, uh, the effective role that a mother tongue plays. We, it, it's hard if we hold that idea that you know, we have a unitary uh, language representation in the language that we use. Um, and when languages are extra, additional languages are introduced with, with a view to oppress or to, or, or to displace or to re replace a language, then that's when we run into problems. So what do we do? If we want to change the outcomes, we have to change the bl blueprint. If you start from a different blueprint, we have a better uh, chance of, uh, re of a different outcome. Um, so the first thing I always tell to my students who are in education or who are going to be in education, um, if they show any hesitation in introducing other languages and, and thinking that that might not um, reflect their respect for the student's mother language or variety that they bring from home, I said, what you have to think of doing is adding to the student's linguistic repertoire. So forget a perspective that is deficit related, that it's you know, taking away the, the language expression that the student brings from home, but rather adding to that because you are going to gain in terms of communicative possibilities, right? Um, you have to discuss access with the students. I wouldn't be talking to you guys here today if I didn't speak English. This is a matter of access because I guess most of you don't speak Portuguese, yes? And so this gives me access to a, a wider audience, but that doesn't make me love Portuguese any less, okay? You empower students through language for, the, for those very same reasons. You know, the, the bigger your repertoire, the bigger, the, the, the wider uh, the situations of communication in which you can be successful, okay? But at the same time, you celebrate the language that the student brings from home. That language is as rich, as good, as linguistically powerful as the new languages that you are introducing, okay? So you have to highlight those home languages as well. And then you teach students about purpose and audience. We make these decision, decisions about purpose all the time. If you're going to a party, you choose one kind of attire, which is different than if you're going to the gym, which is different than if you're going to the beach, which is different than if you're going from the, to school, okay? So we make changes in other realms of life to adapt to purpose and audience all the time. And we can do the same thing with languages, okay? And you know, we can reimagine then this classroom as a place of linguistic diversity that mirrors the linguistic diversity in the world, but it still has relative autonomy. Sometimes the beauty of the classroom is that you can be there just learning, okay? Um, and ultimately, I think that if we take these steps, we will be fostering linguistic human rights, and the more people see their linguistic human rights respected, the less likely they will be um, to get involved in, in linguistic acts of violence. Okay, so I wanted to just close with this quote. This one is my own. 
Uh, and I wrote this when I, like I said, I started thinking through uh, peace and linguistics and, and, and social linguistics. And it goes, one can imagine a positive peace through language, one that can be achieved by long range respect for and maintenance of linguistic rights, the ecology of languages, cultural linguistic diversity, and language education. Such a piece is of much interest in social linguistic studies because its elements speak directly of the survival of language, the ways in which we use language, and our role in changing language relations through education. Okay, so this is us. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're gonna proceed through all three and then open it up. So Zena, please. I'm going to use the podium. Please. I'm just waiting for them to pull up my slides. There we go. So in this presentation, I examine some of the key linkages between language security and peace and argue that such linkages must be fully explored in planning and implementing programs in conflict-affected contexts. In particular, I draw on educational research and practice at various interconnected levels, including national, subnational, institutional, and classroom levels to consider how language factors may exacerbate or mitigate direct and structural forms of violence. As sociopolitical spaces, Schools are microcosms of the larger social context, and they allow for particular insights into the relationship between language, peace, and security. Our purpose today, then, is first to review evidence on the distinct role that language policy plays in conflict, peace, and security. While the field of language policy is well established, and language policy debates have been central to the development of educational systems worldwide, Conversations about language issues within peace, conflict, and security studies has lagged. This is despite the acute and documented ways in which language issues impact the security of children, youth, and their communities. So our second purpose then today is to think across these traditionally distinct fields using findings from educational research and practice that illuminate particular linkages and with a view to improving the design and implementation of policies and programs in conflict-affected contexts. In order to consider the relationship between language and conflict, it's helpful to reflect on manifestations of violence in terms of direct and structural violence. Direct violence is often conflated with conflict and refers to overt, physical, and visible forms of violence. Structural violence, on the other hand, is generally understood as systemic social injustice that manifests itself as inequality, including power over or participation in decision-making processes and resource distribution, and consequently, unequal life chances. Direct and structural forms of violence are interconnected, as structural violence has been shown to be a core driver of direct violence, and direct violence is often a manifestation of long-term grievances. Also, in situations of protracted conflict, direct violence creates new forms of structural violence or reinforces historically entrenched inequalities. This is particularly evident in contexts where there are uneven geographies of conflict. That is, direct violence uh, differentially, differentially impacts populations uh, within a larger geography. So these forms of violence are experienced in terms of insecurity. We can think of security then in terms of the absence of direct violence, but also in terms of the mitigation of other vulnerabilities wrought by structural violence. In this sense, peace can be understood as requiring both security as well as the presence of equitable structures that promote equal life chances. The observations I share here emerge from research and practice from multiple contexts. Uh, methods and sources include an extensive review of research and program documents 
interviews with practitioners of education from international and local NGOs, and schools working in conflict-affected contexts, and qualitative and survey-based research that I have been engaged in in Lebanon. This presentation offers some highlights from findings. Uh, first, I'll summarize key issues that emerge that link language factors with direct and structural forms of violence. I'll then turn to policy considerations for conflict-affected contexts. In brief, a review of the evidence base demonstrates that language issues impact the security of children, youth, and their communities. Uh, let's consider these linkages now um, in terms of direct and structural forms of violence. Language policy is linked to conflict and may exacerbate or mitigate direct violence. This is particularly evident in cases where one language has been historically imposed, privileging its speakers, or where decisions to privilege one group over others through newer language policies exacerbates tensions. We can see examples of this around the world. We can think of Sudan, Pakistan, Kenya, Liberia. Language is also an overt identity marker that may lead to targeted forms of violence. Uh, language and language varieties can signify ethnic, religious, socioeconomic, or political difference, all of which have been used to target populations and individuals. Um, one example of this, we can think of Palestinians during the Lebanese uh, Civil War, where their uh, language variety um, was used to target individuals who may not look different from the Lebanese population, but in speaking, can be identified as such, and assassinations were carried out on this basis. In some cases, ethno-linguistic communities have been driven out of areas and in moving back to locales that share their language have not been able to secure homes or livelihoods. Furthermore, forced migration resulting from direct violence often leads to linguistic heterogeneity of social and educational spaces. This raises the significance of language factors in conflict-affected contexts. Displacement strips populations of material resources, economic opportunities, and social networks, exacerbating inequalities in access to social goods, such as educational services. This situation is made worse when language creates additional barriers. In fact, direct violence creates shifts in language dynamics and governments, donors, agencies, and schools are often confronted with language dilemmas in terms of which language or languages to support and how. In education, this is particularly an issue when qualified teachers and students do not readily share a common language. However, language politics also shift with the evolving nature of conflict. For example, pressures to take up a particular language policy in the immediate post-conflict period which is often a language of wider communication, may diminish over time. At the same time, observations from the Middle East and the North Africa region, where I do most of my research uh, over the past few years, suggest that political conflict brings disputes about language policy and education into the public arena, creating a pull towards, in, in that case, Arabic, uh, that is articulated in terms of patriotic ideals. At the same time, direct violence creates an impetus for youth to learn foreign languages as a pathway to security. Finally, and while the research base is not conclusive, there is evidence to suggest that language policy and education may be linked to psychosocial well-being in conflict-affected contexts, particularly where learning in the mother tongue improves self-esteem and cultivates a sense of social identity, psychological safety, and community integrity. Given the trauma experienced by children and youth in contexts of conflict, the possible connection between mother tongue instruction and psychosocial well-being is worth pursuing. Language policy is linked to inequality and may exacerbate or mitigate structural violence. In education, the research base demonstrates that language policy is differentially experienced by children and youth in their schools. Social conflict, political violence, and inequality mediate this experience against a backdrop of colonial legacies, nationalist agendas, and contemporary global political and economic pressures 
that increasingly shape the educational experiences of children and youth. Disparity in linguistic access is productive of social inequality, an articulated sense of injustice, and ultimately disengagement from school, particularly where certain linguistic identities are stigmatized by social and political processes. We know from extensive studies that learning in one's mother tongue results in better learning outcomes. Mother tongue instruction improves equitable access to education, particularly for language minorities. For example, according to an analysis of data from 22 developing countries and 160 language groups, children who had access to instruction in their mother tongue were significantly more likely to be enrolled and at attending school while a lack of education in first language was a significant reason for children dropping out. Since education has been linked with economic and social goods, we can see how language policy and education may serve to exacerbate or mitigate structural violence. The research base also demonstrates that language policy may privilege certain groups by raising the status or functionality of particular languages for accessing social, political, and economic goods. This in turn may aggravate inequalities, including access to economic opportunities, social networks, and services such as schooling. Language policy is linked to inclusion and exclusion in conflict-affected contexts. This is illustrated, for example, by displaced populations who move to a place with a different language, which they must learn or face further exclusion. At the same time, if young people are not educated in their home language, it reduces the possibility of returning to their place of origin and completing schooling in their home country. Even where refugees share the same language with their host populations, different languages of instruction policies uh, can lead to exclusion. As previously mentioned, language factors have been identified as one of the leading reasons for youth dropping out of school. And in a recent example, if we think of Syrian refugees in Lebanon, um, this is one of the cases that we can look at quite readily to see this playing out. While the Syrians and the Lebanese share a common mother tongue, the schooling system in Lebanon um, is bilingual and therefore has created access barriers for Syrian young people to enter school. And one might say, well, that could be easily resolved. There is a common language there. However, we need to understand that this is in a larger social and political context in which language barriers then play out in particular ways because they are reflective of larger issues. Right? So we have to consider these factors um, when we're thinking through issues of structural violence. Language policy in education is central to decreasing social and economic vulnerabilities. Carefully considered language policy in education has the potential to reduce barriers to access for diverse learning communities and conflict-affected contexts. Research among school-aged youth in Lebanon for example, also suggests that conflict creates these push and pull factors towards certain languages, including the mother tongue. Youth talk about language issues in terms of political and economic insecurity and social inequality, which shows that youth in conflict-affected contexts are keenly aware of language factors as part of conflict dynamics. They also recognize language learning as a key to mitigating vulnerabilities created by direct and structural forms of violence. Thus, language policy becomes a site of contestation for contemporary youth concerns, particularly where youth are conscious of disparities in bilingual policy implementation across schools. The complex relationships between language and conflict demonstrate the need to identify language factors as part of conflict analysis and to address these through concerted and inclusive policy dialogue. There is a clear need for identifying language factors as part of conflict analysis and needs assessment. As we've seen, language factors may exacerbate direct and structural forms of violence. Therefore, conflict analysis must take into consideration the multiple relationships among language, conflict, and security. 
Research from education indicates that language factors must also be considered in needs assessments. For example, while the evidence base supports mother tongue instruction, teaching in the student's first language depends on conditions that may not be existent, possible, or optimal in conflict-affected contexts. For example, it, it requires uh, first a written form of the language, uh, linguistic homo homogeneity among the students. It requires support for mother tongue instruction among policymakers, school leaders, teachers, and parents. It requires teachers with proficiency in the languages of instruction or teachers who can mobilize bilingual student peers or community volunteers as language assistants in the classroom. It requires teachers trained in the principles of second language and literacy learning to help enable the transition to a language of wider communication. And it requires sufficient teaching and learning materials in the particular language or languages. These conditions are often very difficult to achieve in conflict-affected contexts. What this illustrates is that decisions about language policy, whether in education or otherwise, require concerted and inclusive policy dialogue that takes into account complex social and political factors alongside material realities that are part of the policy context. Finally, it's important to note that because of the dynamic nature of conflict, language factors may change with the evolving situation. Thus, policy considerations cannot be static. They must reflect these dynamics and be ready to move with the changing situation. In summary, and as we've seen, the evidence base suggests that inclusion of language factors in peace and security discussions and careful language policy and planning at national, subnational, and school levels can mitigate vulnerabilities created by direct and structural forms of violence and contribute to laying the foundations for peace and security. Thank you. That is not mine. <laughs> okay. So, a uh, good afternoon. Uh, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here today uh, to celebrate uh, the International Mother Language Day and to share my experience working uh, on a multilingual education uh, in southern Thailand conflict zone. So um, I would like to start with this sentence. Language plays important roles as medium of communication and as expression of identity, language use and language choice are uh, therefore pivotal in both crisis and crisis resolution. I would like to give you a background about, about Thailand. Uh, Thailand is in the, in the center of Southeast, mainland Southeast Asia, uh, which is uh, the uh, area of the, uh, which is the complex area of language and ethnicity in the world. Uh, so, uh, so Thailand <coughs> represents uh, the characteristic of Southeast Asia. For language and cultural diversity in Thailand, uh, 65 million populations speak about 70 plus living languages belonging to five language families. Um, Thai is the official 
is the only official national language. Uh, it's derived from a variety of Central Thai, and about 50% um, of the population uh, use, can speak it uh, proficiency and uh, use it as their mother tongue. Uh, it is, uh, Thai is used uh, as the medium of instruction uh, at all level of education and all over the country. Uh, the language situation in Thailand is that now most of the ethnic minority languages are uh, facing language shift and language decline. Another problem is that, uh, is that uh, the, is the um, underachievement in school uh, of the ethnic minority children. And the majority of the people in Thailand are Buddhists. Uh, at the border, at the border area, uh, there are large language groups. This language group, um, um, not only that their mother tongue, the other language is, di is declining, but the majority of the, pe of the people cannot reach the government services, uh, especially in, in the southern uh, area. Uh, I would like to uh, take you down to Thailand's deep south. Uh, there in Thailand's deep south, we have Thailand Melayu. 80% of the population, or more than one million people, uh, speak Patani Malay. Um, it was uh, once uh, a Patani Malay, is, it was one of Patani uh, Sultanate and the center of Islamic uh, studies. And we believe that language uh, identity issue is uh, one of the main causes underlying the political unrest and violence in the area. Uh, this picture shows uh, some of the violence uh, in the area. Uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, some of the schools have been burned down and uh, the teachers uh, or educational per personnel have been killed. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in Thailand Deep South, there are two main issues. One is the language identity issue. That is, the mother tongue, the Patini Malay, is not ex officially accepted and used in school. And the ethnic minority, uh, uh, the ethnic language is declining. The uh, kind of cre creole uh, is forming, uh, especially in the city, uh, in the city area. And, and uh, another, another uh, issue is the chronic underachievement in school of the student in that area. Uh, the, the student have the lowest score at the national testing. Uh, it ha uh, uh, about 40% uh, of the, of the student at, in, uh, at grade three uh, cannot uh, uh, read and write. So um, uh, there are some uh, problem over, over there. And uh, there is a fear that education is being used uh, to destroy the lang their language identity and uh, religious identity. So this, uh, this uh, graph show the reading and writing ability of the student in the South compare, compared to the national average. Uh, you can see that for reading ability, about 55.5% 55, cannot in grade three cannot read at, cannot read at all. And uh, 70 something, I can't see very well, uh, uh, need improvement compared to the, uh, to the, one, uh, to the 4% uh, and 3% uh, at, at the national level. And uh, writing ability is even worse. 42.11% cannot write at all in at grade three, and uh, about 20% uh, percent, uh, need uh, improvement comparing to the national average, uh, at, uh, uh, which is a, a lot lower. So this, there is a big uh, problem in reading and writing for the student in that area. So uh, after the uh, uh, survey, the language situation survey, we found that Patani Malay language is the language that people use, uh, use most and they prefer to use it. And there was also the request from the people, uh, from the, in, from the uh, survey, uh, request that 
the Batini Malay, the language, the local language should be used in education to help the student to understand the lesson. So uh, the Batini Malay Thai mother tongue based bilingual education uh, has been conducted. Uh, it is conducted as an action participatory research project implemented in four pilot school in southern in four thousand uh, in four uh, southern border provinces. It's an, an it's a nine year project starting from kindergarten one to grade six, including one year of preparation. The goal is to facilitate Patni Malay speaking children to speak, read, and write well in both Patni Malay and Thai. Uh, to retain their Malay identity at the local level and Thai identity at the national level, and to be able to live with dignity in the wider Thai society to foster true and uh, lasting national reconciliation. Uh, and the educational principal use is the child center known to unknown principal with the bridging process. Uh, that is, we try to uh, <coughs> Bridge the home, uh, the home language and culture of the stu of, of the students to the school language and culture, uh, to bridge local language to official language, uh, to bridge the spoken to written language, and uh, bridge the everyday language to academic language, and also uh, local content to the international or local or universal content, and to go through this the bilingual. Uh, program, Patani Malay Thai Bilingual Program, uh, there are nine activities that we have to, that we uh, work on, starting from the preliminary research, uh, uh, curriculum development, and, and you know, all, everything, to uh, policy uh, development, the policy that support uh, the mother tongue-based multilingual education. Uh, since the Patani Malay is just a spoken language, uh, to, to use it in the education system, uh, we, uh, the writing system has got to be established. There are three kinds of uh, script in the, in the area. One is a Jawi, which is Arabic-based script, and is used for um, uh, religious uh, document, but it's widely used, and uh, some of the people think that uh, the, the, Yavi, the Malay written in Javi language is their language identity. And then the second one is Rumi. It is a Romanized script. Uh, it's popular among those who uh, uh, have educated in uh, uh, Malaysia or Indonesia. And the last one is the Thai script, the Thai-based Patani Malay. It is widely used uh, for non-formal education, for teaching the uh, Thai government official, and also to to, uh, to record uh, all the oral literature, the poem and everything, uh, the poem, the folk tales and everything. So after all the discussion, uh, the Thai based Patini Malay, uh, or the Patini Malay writing in Thai script uh, was finally selected for pedagogical and political reason. And uh, uh, this man uh, said that he can write everything he think uh, in Thai based script, and he is now uh, writing the children games. Um, uh, for this, uh, <coughs> uh, for the for this uh, for the multilingual education in southern Thailand, the uh, curriculum has got to be redesigned. So the curriculum development is based on the Ministry of Education standard uh, with additional uh, multilingual principle. Uh, that is the language development, um, uh, academic or concept development, and socio-cultural development. And I would like to show you the language development. It is a step-by-step -step language learning and literacy process. That is, the students start uh, school with their own language, uh, the, with their own language and culture, so they, uh, uh, they have a chance to talk with the teacher who speaks the same language. Uh, so they start with the oral uh, language, uh, with their mother tongue, and then at the same time, in the second semester, uh, Thai, oral Thai uh, is introduced uh, along with the uh, pre-reading and pre-writing in Patani Malay. So in, in uh, 
uh, kindergarten to uh, the student uh, learn to read and write uh, in their mother tongue and they are literate in their mother tongue and and they go on with the uh, con continue with oral Thai then in grade one in grade one they start reading and writing in Thai so the knowledge of uh, uh, the knowledge of their own language, reading and writing in their own language is transferred to the reading and writing in Thai. And then after that, uh, because they have uh, the foundation in uh, Batini Malay, they can go on to uh, the uh, um, Central Malay uh, written in the Yavi script that they, pre that they would like to, to, to have. And also uh, Standard Malay written in Rumi or Romanized or romanized, so that they can uh, have a, a, a way uh, to uh, to the Malay world, to to Malaysia or Indonesia, uh, which is a very important language for us and uh, economic community. So that that is the uh, step by step language learning and literacy process. And at the same time, uh, uh, the project uh, emphasized the higher level thinking. In all subject, uh, and in uh, in all subject, that is, a student uh, don't uh, only know and understand, uh, but they should be able to apply, analyze, uh, evaluate, and synthesize, or to be creative. Uh, and this is the progression plan for the Patini Malay Thai multilingual bilingual education. Uh, it is used; the language is used is taught as a subject uh, Malay. Thai and English, and at the same time, uh, for the for teaching other subjects like mathematics and uh, science and social science, uh, 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 Thai and Patani Malay uh, are used as a language of uh, as a medium of instru instruction um, because the mother tongue is used. Uh, so the, uh, we can get a lot of uh, in participation from. Uh, the community, they can be involved in all aspects of, of, of uh, work. Like uh, writing story, they can write story, doing the editing, drawing, or book binding. And this is some of the uh, teaching materials uh, based on the uh, culture, local culture, and uh, folk tales dictionary. And also, uh, the teachers are from the community. So uh, this is a pic this picture shows the teacher training, and this is the, some of the cultural scene, which is used for stimulating uh, the thinking and um, um, for thinking and, and, and speaking of the children. And also, Thai is taught as a second language. This is the way to teach uh, Thai to teach a second language. And song is also used uh, for the student. So the student learn to uh, listen, uh, listen from the local, uh, listen the local story, thinking and answering, and then also speaking using the uh, this uh, picture story. And they learn to, uh, uh, they learn the chair reading, to chair reading and also writing. You can see that uh, the uh, great, uh, the student uh, kindergarten too can, can write. And this is some of the pictures showing the activities and they, the student really enjoy reading, writing uh, books, which is quite different from before. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, this, this is the uh, picture that show um, that the kindergarten two student can write. Okay, and, and this, this one uh, showed the uh, teaching, uh, the class for teaching science uh, using the sandwich technique that is L1, L2, and L1, not L3, L1, L2, and L1 technique. So the students uh, are very happy, and so the parents, the teacher and the parents are very happy too. Um, uh, yes, uh, they, they say that they, the students are, cu are full of curiosity and uh, asking question and also trying to read uh, all all the advertisement, and another person said that the 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 bilingual education 
uh, is very, very good because the students learn how to read and write when they go up to grade one, and they know both Malay and Thai. So the, uh, this, the father is very happy. And another person who is a religious leader, he said that uh, this project is very useful. It has brought back our Melayu identity. I would like to pray for Allah to make this project sustainable forever. So these are uh, the reaction from the community. And uh, this is the academic assessment uh, done by a local university in the area. You can see that for the experimental school, uh, it, the perform for performance uh, a score at a higher level, uh, you know, at the, at the, uh, from, grade, from 60% to about 90 or 100%, where the comparison school or the regular school, uh, the score, uh, the performance are at the lower score. And, uh, yeah, so the students are very uh, happier, and more talkative, uh, more creative. They love to go to school and they love reading and writing. And the teachers are happy, the parents are proud of their children and the community are pleased and have more confidence with the government school. The parents always come to the window of the school and watching. The teacher who, is, who has more than 20 years uh, of experience teaching uh, said that this bilingual program has solved the problem of language incompetency. In, in addition to being proud of their native language, children have learned to live with others who speak different languages. Communication with different lang languages or unequal levels of language understanding causes dissatisfaction with each other. Thai and Malay people should be able to effectively communicate uh, since we live in the same country. This is from one of the teachers. Uh, so uh, this project, for the success, this project has earned the trust and confidence of the local community involved. But there are challenges. What, what the challenges is that using the local spoken language in education as a way to promote development, peace, and, pros uh, and uh, uh, prosperity, uh, some find it hard to accept because of the fear and do not understand the importance of the mother tongue. And changing of lang language of uh, instruction, new curriculum, new teaching materials, uh, New teaching methods require teachers to learn new methods to facilitate children's uh, imagination, creativity, and, and uh, talking. And also, uh, the mother tongue-based uh, bilingual education using, um, <coughs> uh, using the Thai-based Patri uh, Malay uh, some of the religious leaders uh, and, uh, and in intellectuals are not happy about it. They don't, they don't like it. They prefer to use the Arabic based uh, or Javi script uh, in, the, in the teaching. Uh, and and that, another thing is that the project uh, is um, carried out in the region uh, where there, there are violence, so it's very difficult uh, to work uh, in the area, and uh, there are uh, lack of trust in the area. So, but anyway, because uh, it's, it is uh, uh, satisfactory to the stakeholder, uh, they have expansion school, about 15 expansion school. This picture shows the training, the, the teacher training of the 15 expansion school, and we also have another project for institutionalizing teacher education for mother tongue based bilingual education in the faculty of uh, education uh, at the local university in the area. So, and finally, I would like to uh, mention about the national language policy of Thailand, which has been drafted and accepted by the authority concerned. Uh, it is it is rather generous. It's a six-pronged policy, and it takes care of not only the 
Thai, which is the uh, national official language, but it also take care of the international uh, neighboring languages, uh, the ethnic minority languages, the language for the labor migrant, and also the language for the visually and, and hearing uh, uh, impaired. And uh, the, the ultimate goal of this uh, national language policy is language for sustainable peace. And uh, mother tongue or mother language is used as a core or the fundament or the foundation of other function uh, languages. Uh, so I would like to conclude that seeing language as a problem has contributed to violence. But seeing language as a resource and a right can contribute to peace building. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to each of our speakers. I, I think we have a, a, a lot to uh, go on here as our keynotes to kick us off. I'm, I'm struck, uh, for those of us in, in this building, we often uh, appeal to two interesting rubrics uh, when we talk about peace and peace building. One is do no harm. Make sure the policy, make sure the implementation that you're using uh, in entering a, a difficult situation is exactly going to improve conditions rather than worsen them and, and to think seriously about how, that, how that's going to move. Uh, the other is, is we ask one another, what's your theory of change? How do you know that the kinds of things you're going to implement in policy or practice may in fact lead to the goals that you want to go? So we try to cover from, from, from those two angles. And I think our speakers gave us certainly in two cases of Lebanon and Thailand and in some of the discussions of policy and, and the difficulties between physical and structural violence, a lot to go on there. And there's a lot of experience and uh, talent and sensibilities about these questions in this room, I know. So I, I'm not going to talk any longer and, and really invite your, uh, your questions and your responses. Let me say something about logistics here. Uh, we have microphones on two sides of the room. Uh, ask a question please, and as you're given a microphone, identify who you are. And if your question is for the panel generally or for someone in particular, that'll help us. And I think what I'll, I'll tend to do is take two or three at a time and let our panel respond that way rather than just one at a time. So the floor is open. Please, here will be our first, right down here. Thank you. Um, I'm Barbara Trudell, Director of Research and Advocacy for SIL Africa, living in Nairobi. And I wanted to thank all the speakers for um, some really interesting and amazing perspectives on this whole issue of language, peace, and security. I had a, I had a question uh, that was prompted by, uh, I believe it was Patricia or, 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 or Terrence, that said something about, and maybe the others of you would also speak to it, but. Um, the importance of adding to the linguistic repertoire of, um, well, certainly the, a minority uh, language speaking population. And, and the way that you attain stable societal multilingualism in a broader national linguistic environment that may not be really uh, friendly to the mother tongue. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm thinking of uh, experience I've had in the, in the Peruvian Amazon in particular, in which indigenous groups there uh, adding to their linguistic repertoire, that is to say, uh, multilingualism and moving out, in many cases uh, led to their assimilation into the larger society. Um, they were not strong enough, they were not numerous enough, they didn't have the political means to, to keep their own selves uh, linguistically or culturally. And so the, the challenge of these very dominant languages in some cases and my question is, what kind of environment lessens the power of that dominant language for the minority language community, allowing the mother tongue to, to flourish and to find a stable space? Thank you. Thank you. Good question. We have another down here. Thanks. I'm Peter Loach. I work here at USIP. I'm also an adjunct instructor at GW. and. Um, Associate Fellow at Timothy Dwight College at Yale. 
Um, a question you've encountered before, I'm sure. If one of the functions of, of a language is to say, this is an us-ness, we're going to preserve this because this is us, it's a unifying effect, language necessarily, therefore, says we are not them and it has an othering effect, which seems, one could argue, to reinforce the premise of conflict that is us, not them, and we have to preserve our space, sort of language. You're at Arizona State, you've talked to Rick Ashley, his stuff. How would you respond to that argument? Thank you. Those are two good ones. Do we have a third? Right here, this young one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erica Vasquez, and I'm a PhD candidate at Georgetown University in Arabic sociolinguistics. Um, thank you to all of you for your presentations. They were wonderful. And my question is actually prompted by um, Professor Zakaria. Uh, my own research focuses on the relationship between language and peace in the Western Sahara and Morocco and the intractability of that conflict. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, in times of crisis and in conflict, when we have migrations of refugees into neighboring countries, what is the priority of uh, enhancing or changing linguistic policies in educational systems to accommodate the flow of refugees and these differences between you know, Fusha and Amiya and different um, systems? So. Thank you. Well, those are three good and challenging ones to get us started. Who'd like to start? Uh, if I could address your question, because that's one that I struggle with all the time, right? It's, in a way, easy to talk about peace. And then when you go um, to particular communities, you see a pattern where it, it's hard to preserve a minority language once another language is introduced. Um, I think what we talked about here, I didn't talk about that, but the, the situation in Thailand, one of the, one of the key factors is oral-only uh, oral languages are a lot harder uh, to preserve. Um, and I think that there have been very nice initiatives, you know, because uh, a lot of times we see the internet as a threat to minority languages, but there have been very nice in initiatives to not only codify, but where the languages are codified, to use the internet as a cool space where especially the younger generations would feel an association with that particular language to be something desirable. Because one of the things that happens is that we know that minority languages, especially in situations of immigration, it is within the second generation that they tend to go. Um, and so to create an environment in any way possible where younger generations feel that having that language and speaking that language is desirable, and I, I cannot think of another word but cool, which makes me very uncool probably in the eyes of my children, but that's fine. Uh, so any situation that can one codify it so that there is a, a written script of that. And when there is a motivation, you know, because we know that there is access, but there is also motivation to learn and motivation to keep. So part of the key is creating a motivation to learn and a motivation to keep so that in the long run, younger generations will want to participate, be a part of that linguistic community as well. So they see the other language, you know, the other, the additional language as an asset. But at the same time, there is this uh, identity and this coolness associated with the original minority language. Thank you. I'll, I'll take a shot at your question, which um, I thought is good. Uh, I think the common perception is that one language unifies. But when you have a status differential between the populations using different languages, uh, then uh, the, the experience of the dominant language is experienced as an imposition. Uh, and so in, in some cases where we've had languages or populations that were in somewhat in, pop, uh, in competition with one another, where they're in a, in a position to interact with each other, one of the challenges is to increase the status of the language that is more stigmatized. Uh, in the United States, we have a lot of uh, dual language or two-way uh, programs in bilingual education. Uh, depending on the type of children that enter the schools, uh, if in fact, we, we have to recognize that in, in that situation that English is generally the dominant language. And so uh, sometimes programmatically, uh, we have to think not only just in terms of how it's used in instruction, but how it's used in the broader community of the school in order to elevate the status of the language that's the minority language. And that really requires a lot of thinking. I can think of one case on the Navajo reservation 
uh, where uh, they attempted an immersion program uh, in uh, the use of Navajo. And initially, they were not very successful. They then changed the, the practices of everyone in the school so that uh, they wanted everyone in the school to start using Navajo, including the janitors and uh, the, the maintenance people and everybody. And uh, several years later, they were having a very successful response because the language was taking on a, a social reality in the school. Just in one other context, in a kind of reverse situation, uh, one of the challenges around the world right now is uh, that given the emphasis on particularly English as an additional language of instruction or uh, many times as the medium of instruction, we're not creating a safe space for people to learn other languages where there's conflict between populations. Uh, this is a point that uh, Elena Shohami from Israel has made in terms of the emphasis on English uh, in the curriculum there that sometimes that doesn't allow enough space for Hebrew speakers to learn Arabic and Arabic speakers to learn uh, Hebrew. So uh, we can think of this not only in where we have maybe two languages in competition, but where we're really trying to, to work out some other issues while bringing in uh, foreign languages. Thank you. I'll take the, the third question. I think, I think your question was, what is the priority um, of changing language policy in, in instances of forced migration? Was that, I'm not sure how to take your question. Is it what is the priority or what should be the priority? Because this is kind of, um, in fact, it has not taken on high priority in practice. And um, this is unfortunate because by not doing so, many children in such contexts end up um, not not able to not not able to access school. Um, however, we have seen in more recent years uh, sort of more increased awareness around language factors, and so I think probably in the af in the second half we're going to hear from practitioners who are actually making that a priority, um, and it does need to be a priority because without addressing the language factor, you're really um, depriving a generation of children um, from, from their education. Um, and so those kind of things need to be taken into consideration almost immediately. And there are ways to do it. There's no reason why it cannot be done per se, although there can be logistical nightmares if it is a very large um, population of displaced. Um, and there are interesting examples, uh, for example, um, uh, the work that's happening with uh, Rohingya Burmese uh, refugees in Bangladesh uh, refugee camps and the kinds of conversations that they've had to go through to figure out what language um, they will be educated in in the refugee camp, um, particularly when populations don't want to go back home. So there's also, there are many dynamics um, to, to be considered, um, but having an explicit discussion about the language issue is what I'm really pressing us on. What the outcome of that discussion is will depend on the particular context and what is in the best interest of those populations at a particular time. Um, but you need to bring into those conversations uh, lots of people, the young people themselves, their parents, uh, their community leaders, um, and other you know, donors and agencies that support them or governments that support them or do not. And so it can be quite complicated, but uh, it should be a priority, yes. Thank you, and, and just a quick footnote. We, in a, in a room in this building earlier today, looking particularly at the comparative analysis of Colombia with Syria, with places close to a peace agreement in Colombia, but very far in Syria, one of the themes that kept returning is all the dislocation for internally and externally displaced people. You know, Colombia long ranking the, the, long, the largest number of, in, in terms of pure number, internally displaced, but what's happening in Syria as a percentage of the population unprecedented. And every dimension of schooling, language, culture, uh, and certainly health dynamics is, is at stake there. So it's a great question. Let's go to a second round.
I think we can start with this good person in the middle here. They'll fight over you with the microphones because you're directly in the middle. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Emily Vargas Barron. I work at the RISE Institute. And I wanted to thank all of our presenters. These are excellent and inspiring uh, presentations. Uh, I'd like to make actually two comments. Since you mentioned Colombia, in Colombia too, there is a tremendous ethnic minority language issue, which has complicated tremendously, especially for those of ethnic minorities, the problems around violence. So I think there too you have this uh, pattern coming in, but people rarely talk about it, unfortunately. Uh, I wanted to make a, a comment about the issue of studying policy. I am feeling the tremendous need for uh, those of us who have worked on language policies and language policy embedded within policies of education, early childhood development, economic development, et cetera, to open a dialogue and a discourse around the mechanics of policy planning to enable us to begin to elucidate those points which are most susceptible for change. I think we've discovered some of them, but I feel the need of individual case studies in rather in depth and with criteria that perhaps we wouldn't think of alone, but we might in group. And secondly, comparative studies across policies uh, and across regions. So I just wanted to see if any of you would like to pick up on that topic. Thank you. Second one, right here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nicole Marcus. I work at Second Language Testing, Inc. Um, and my question, I have two questions for the work in Thailand, which I think is amazing, by the way, to start up those schools. And uh, so my first question is, I was wondering where your funding's coming from, if it's from the local or the local organizations helping fund that. And my second um, is what happens after grade six. And the reason I'm asking this is because I did my dissertation research in linguistics on um, an endangered language called Gascon in southwest France, which is, um, it's also qualified as an Occitan language. And they had started these private schools, which actually started um, just from a teacher in his backyard with uh, like three kids they started and now it's grown to over 100 schools throughout the Occitan region, which um, spans across southern France. And the issue is, is it's an immersion school, and it's amazing. And I um, observed um, about 10 schools in the region. Um, but the problem is, is it's, it's the same um, program, where it ends at grade six. And what happens in France is they don't have it officially. It's not an officially recognized language. So when the students grow up, they can only take um, it as an optional course in certain um, middle school, junior high schools, and high schools, and not all schools even offer it. So the problem is if they don't have, well, most of, um, sorry, most of the, um, the language is not taught at home, basically, um, which is why these schools are so important to get the language um, back in the area. So if they can't, um, take a language course in a junior high or high school, basically they may lose the language because they're just going to be exposed to French. So this overlaps with the previous question is it's just urging the need for a national educational policy because even though the Colandredas are amazing in the Occitan region, there is that problem where after the students finish grade six, they may lose the language. So. Thank you. Do we have one more for this round? Please. Hello, my name is Maiwan Navid. I'm assistant professor at the Defense Language Institute. Um, I first of all, thank you so much for very great presentations. In regard to the language, so we talked about language, that uh, language is a catalyst for peace, security, and at the same time there is a good correlation exists between language and culture because you cannot really develop language without culture, so you have to know the culture. And we know about the culture that um, most of the places, a lot of problems are created by the cultures. And for instance, if we talk about Yugoslavia, they broke down along the culture lines, not really language lines. And also Samuel Huntington, he wrote a good article on that in 1993, that there will be a clash of civilization 
not along political lines, but cultural lines. Uh, so my question is, uh, are we hypothesizing that there will be uh, some kind of problem caused by uh, languages if it's not improved, one thing. And a second thing, in 2010, um, uh, General McChrystal, he um, gave an order to uh, Defense Department that any soldier who is going overseas, they should be taught a uh, foreign language. And the State Department, they do have a language program, but the people who are going through that language process, they not become proficient so that they can communicate with the people. Uh, even though we do good work, like our Peace Corps, they are doing a great job overseas, but unfortunately, we don't have the ability to communicate with people. So did we fail in our foreign policy to actually um, teach the people who are working in the State Department enough language so that they can communicate and tell people this is what we do, and that way the people can keep their interest in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good set of three. Come back to the panel. Who would like to start us off? Uh, so. Can I? Uh, yes, please. Answer the question. Um, uh, do you ask um, where is the funding come from, right? The first, the first one. Uh, the project, the Patani Malay Thai uh, Bilingual Education uh, Project, we have got the uh, funding from, you, from the UNICEF. That is for the start. Start with the UNICEF. And then uh, later on, uh, we have, when, when UNICEF uh, cannot help very much, they, they have less money. So the Thailand, we have, we have the funding from Thailand Research Fund. And also later, Mahidon University also co-funding for this particular project because uh, people think that, think that uh, it is useful and it should be carried out until uh, grade six, from kindergarten one to grade six. And then another, so we have, uh, we have uh, three main uh, funding uh, agency to, uh, uh, for the, for the, for the uh, pilot project. And then for the expansion project, we have got the funding from uh, the government, from the government, the, the local government in the South uh, would like us to uh, expand the project to another 15 school as it's still a kind of pilot uh, school for, for, for the, uh, you know, school, the government school. And then uh, for the teacher education, we have got an, 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 an uh, this is another project. We have got a funding from EU to uh, institu institutionalizing teacher education for multilingual education in the South. So we have got funding uh, from various uh, funding agency. And then uh, you asked about what happened after grade six. After grade six, uh, linked with the uh, national uh, policy. So the, the national policy, the new, our new national policy tried to promote the use of the mother tongue uh, at all level. Uh, at the, at the uh, pre-primary and primary level, uh, it can be used, it should be used uh, as the medium of instruction, especially for the, uh, few, the first few years of schooling. And then later on, uh, it, it uh, uh, can be taught as a subject. I mean, the language and also the oral literature can be taught as a subject. And I think for after grade six, uh, they can go on teaching uh, as a subject. I think that is, uh, that is the, the uh, if they can. So uh, according to the new national language policy, uh, the mother tongue is promoted, is promoted and should be uh, used in education. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to take one? I'll, um, if I fully understood the question, I'll take a shot at the one with the reference to Yugoslavia. Uh, and the question was, I think, on the priority of the language versus culture as you know, what's more salient. Uh, I think in many contexts, it really depends on the situation. Uh, but uh, there's 
a position that has been out there for some time that when there are conflict situations involving language, if we look across a field of domains, if we look in the economic sphere in the workplace, if we look in the legal system, if we look at voter rights, if we look at the school system, for example, that conflicts involving language usually have deeper causes. And uh, so I think you know, there's, there's always something more at stake than just the language. But in the specific case of Yugoslavia, um, I'm recalling a, a volume that I uh, contributed to in 2002. Uh, the International Journal of Sociology of Language uh, was a thematic issue on revisiting the mother tongue question. It was a thematic title. And uh, Jim Tollefson, James Tollefson, uh, specifically looked at the case of Yugoslavia uh, as it was starting to break down. And uh, one of the first symptoms that he identified as the breakdown was the loss of linguistic rights in the former Yugoslavia. And that became an, an indication that basically the, there were these deeper uh, issues related to ethnicity were, were in fact there. But uh, you might, you might want to take a look at that. He's done extensive work on the Yugoslavian issue. To that, to maybe the second part of your comment, which is um, about State Department language programs, um, and indeed a national security languages initiative that has been quite extensive in trying to fund what are considered national security interest languages, or critical languages, I think is what they're called, um, for national security. Um, and you asked, did we fail in this kind of policy to you know, not educate um, the people we're sending out or whatever in languages. Um, yes, I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, but there are a couple of things to it. It's not just in, in not teaching languages to improve communication or, I mean, that's one layer of it. But I think it's really interesting that on the one hand we're promoting through such programs, um, language policy or languages uh, for a, a, what we would call negative peace, right, for security purposes. On the other hand, in US public schools, the languages that children already have in their families, who, what they already speak, and many of them being national security languages, these critical languages that are on this list, um, are not promoted in US public schools. So we have some kind of odd disconnect there um, between what is promoted. It's basically the critical languages are promoted for the non-speakers, but they are not promoted for the families that already speak those languages and who are American citizens serving their country and so on. So there is something of a failure there as well, I would argue. Um, and then on the comment about the need for um, case studies on the mechanics of policy and planning, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree, um, and maybe that will be the next thing I work on, but um, there is absolutely uh, the need for a discussion and kind of a documentation of how that goes down. I think, unfortunately, in acute crisis and uh, conflict contexts, it happens so rapidly and um, uh, often there isn't a possibility to document uh, some of the processes that take place in these contexts. And so we often lose some of the best learning that can come out of uh, documenting case studies. So thank you for pointing that out. Thank you, Terrence Wilmer. Uh, just as a footnote to that, uh, there, there are a number of case studies that are done in uh, some of the major journals, uh, particularly language policy. But uh, we've also documented uh, negative experience of what happens when you don't have appropriate policies. Uh, one of our colleagues uh, at the Center for Applied Linguistics is publishing a book that should be out this year, which is called uh, Language as Policy and Consequence, the Arizona Case Studies, where the uh, imposition of uh, English-only policies and their effects on the minority populations there have been documented. 
uh, extensively and all the way down to the level of the classroom and from the views of the students. Uh, in positive uh, sense, uh, you know, there are examples of successful or at least uh, promising revitalization efforts, uh, one of which is, uh, you know, the revitalization of Welsh and Wales. And uh, that is a, that there is a very extensive policy that begins with uh, preschool education all the way through university education. And they have had some degree of success with that policy. So uh, there are places that we can go for some positive examples. And then, of course, the extensive work done on Maori, uh, Maori language or the Hawaiian language would be other places to look. And I just wanted to say one more thing. And I, I completely agree with what you say, valuing the languages that are already there and how that seems such a disconnect um, in, in, in policy. But I also wanted to highlight that I think that even though there are um, offerings of um, other languages to, the, to populations that are not minority populations, I think that we work very little in attitudinal terms to turn around people's views on bilingualism, multilingualism. And actually, uh, there is no greater sense, I think, of of uh, s identifying and sympathizing with minority populations than to actually have the experience of learning and having to communicate, but also doing with language, languages all of the things that we do with languages that are not necessarily of an immediate uh, communicative um, uh, nature. Um, because we often associate, well, I, I don't need to learn an additional language because I, I can go and speak English everywhere, for example, um, you know, if we're going to take English into consideration. But there are all of the other things that languages do that a person who is not given the opportunity to learn will not be doing through these um, additional languages. So I think it's not only work, and I, I think that we focus more on, you know, policy that will impact minority populations, and we should be doing a lot of work with the general population as well. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more round before our break. In the far back, we can work our way down there. My name's Ellen Street, and I'm studying TESOL at the University of Missouri Online, but have recently moved to the DC area to job search. Um, I, I'm gonna do my thesis on motivation, and so uh, what you said really resonated with me, and um, I thought just as one of the younger people in the room that I should explain why, um, why young people often don't want to learn what their parents speak, because if your parents speak it, it's uncool. Exactly. But if you're learning Arabic and nobody else learns it, it's something that's cool and edgy. It's mm -hmm. something unique. So that's, it's just got to come from your friends, and it's got to come from a motivation of something to be, oh, I'm, I want to be the same as everybody else because I'm a teenager, and that's what we do. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what I have to say. There you go. Thank you. In front right here. There you go. Kira Tato, I'm Margaret Gleeson from um, Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand. So, Dr. Wiley, I was interested in what you said about the Maori language um, just recently. My question really is about, um, about teacher education and sustaining teacher education. One of the issues that we've had in New Zealand <clears throat> is that despite Maori language immersion schools in uh, kindergarten level, primary school level, by the time um, secondary school education starts, there aren't teachers who are qualified to be subject teachers and also have um, academic Māori to the extent that they can actually instruct in that language. And so in the Thai situation, I was really interested because at least Māori has been a written language for many years now. And uh, in the case that you were talking about, the language had to be transcribed. You had to choose what version you're going to use of the orthography. And then you had to teach the teachers. So. I'm really intrigued about how you recruited teachers, um, how you educated the teachers, what the time period was of educating the teachers, and the, how you see this going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Last one right here. Thank you. I'm Deborah Kennedy from the Center for Applied Linguistics. And as one of the not younger people in the room, <laughs> <laughs> 
one of the things that I appreciated about what each of you said, you alluded to yeah. the fact that change is the only constant in the world of language. Um, and language change very frequently does come from the younger part of our populations. Something that I have heard about, although I haven't seen it personally, is that young people in Saudi Arabia, particularly young men who have access to cell phones, are using them to communicate in a combination of Arabic and English. People all over the world are communicating across cultural and linguistic barriers using cell phones. And I think that's really changing the way we need to think about language learning and language policy. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Thanks. Who wants to start? I can, I can address that because that's one of my interests at the moment. I'm writing about English and the internet. Um, and I think that, um, like I mentioned, you know, there's, there's this one particular study done by uh, Warshan on um, revitalization of um, uh, Hawaiian languages through the internet. And they added that cool factor because now the, the, the friends are using the internet to communicate and, and it's become their, their language. Um, in, in, in many respects, what we would probably see happening, I think, in the long run is a, a blending of some of these languages so that you, you end up with pigeons and creoles that are internet um, originated. Um, and I think that that's, that's a, a new world. And I think that we as educators and policymakers can use it to our advantage because you know, the newer generations will want to participate more um, given the medium. Um, but I think one of the challenges is that before we used to talk about literacy or not, and now we're talking about which kind of literacy, right? And it's almost like we need one form of literacy for each of these different uh, media. And so if you're writing an email, it's a different kind of literacy from um, working uh, on social media, which is different from using it for academic purposes and so on and so forth. So we're not faced with literacy, illiteracy anymore. We're faced with what kind of literacy. Um, David Crystal um, has uh, recently uh, talked about this, and he actually went on a, a talk show um, on, on TV, and he actually made the point that um, uh, texting is good for the English language. Um, and his point was that there are more and more people actually involved in literacy. Um, it's just not probably the way we thought of literacy before. So we ourselves have to adapt to thinking of literacy in different ways. But, you know, I, I don't think in, in, in recent or even less than re recent history do we see so many people engaged with the written word as we see now, right? Uh, but it's just of a, of a different nature, not necessarily of that one variety that we call the standard. And that will, will, that will be not only you know, a matter for societal adaptation, but also for our attitudes towards uh, literacy to perhaps change as well. Thanks. I'm gonna just hop on um, while we're on that topic, to say specifically related to the Arabic language, it's not just that combinations of languages are being used, but that um, to, um, to accommodate the letters in Arabic that don't exist in the English script, a range of numerals are used. And this way of writing in Arabic using English script on uh, t technology um, e emerged very um, organically and is, um, is everywhere. Um, but that's because the technology couldn't keep up with the, the spread in a way, even though the Arabic platform for cell phones was developed quite some time ago. In fact, my brother worked on that work. Um, but uh, so that's, yes, it's going to keep evolving that way. At the same time, though, even though we can think of these multiple literacies and so on, I think the dominant discourse about standard is still extremely powerful. And... Um, in Arabic or in, in um, related to the Arabic language in, in Middle East countries, it is so much so that we talk about the language almost exclusively in terms of the deficiency discourse, right? That young people are completely deficient in the language, they are incompetent of uh, speaking in this or writing properly, not one of them can speak properly, not one of them can write properly, and so on. It's in this country too. So, 
um, on the one hand, yes, it's changing the way that we think. And on the other hand, the dominant discourse remains quite entrenched and, and in the ways that we look at young people as being incompetent, deficient, et cetera, rather than seeing their multiple strengths and, yeah. Purpose and audience. I tell my students, if you don't remember anything else, remember purpose and audience from this class. And then we ourselves fall into the trap of not remembering purpose and audience and thinking of the standard as, you know, something that should be universally enforced in all situations. I absolutely agree. Uh, I would like to answer the uh, question about teacher training. Um, uh, well, in the case of uh, Southern Thailand, uh, in the uh, Patani Malay speaking community, uh, uh, they uh, it, it's not difficult to get to get the, uh, to get somebody uh, to become a teacher. Uh, because this is for the teacher recruitment, uh, the people in in uh, I think that the people in the area um, value uh, uh, the uh, the teacher occupation, so they want to be teacher. They think that this is a, this is a very important uh, job and a good job, and they want to, want to do that job. So it's not difficult to to try to find somebody who want to be a teacher in that area. Another problem is that uh, they, don't, they, they, are, uh, they don't have uh, much opportunity for, for job in that area. So there are a lot of uh, newly graduate, uh, uni newly graduate, university graduate uh, without uh, any job. So it's not uh, too difficult to try to get people to become the teacher. But uh, they, need the, they need some training. They need some training. Uh, so we provide the, train, the, the training for them. The training in uh, 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 reading and writing, Patani uh, Malay, you know, you, by using the, the Thai, Thai script. Uh, normally, they can speak the language, but they never use it in the, in the formal situation, like in school. So the teacher uh, cannot, they, they are not familiar with speaking uh, or using Patani Malay in school we, before before it was uh, prohibited to do that. But uh, when we start the multilingual education program, uh, they start to kind of revival uh, their knowledge uh, uh, of the mother tongue with Patani Malay. And so we have the training, we have the pre-service training for, the, uh, for, the, for the, those who become the te teacher, uh, the, how to uh, read and write, uh, in Patani Malay. And also, uh, uh, we have the training uh, for them to uh, understand the, the uh, or, or, or sometimes uh, uh, ask them to come and work on the curriculum development and also lesson plan. So they help in, they, they help participate uh, in the uh, curriculum development and lesson planning. And also, uh, um, uh, and sometimes they also, oh, oh not sometimes, we have, a, we have a, a, a workshop for them to, uh, to, uh, to work on the uh, teaching materials. We have the teaching material development, so they work on that. And also we have a training uh, for the uh, teaching methods, different kinds of teaching methods, uh, you know, using, uh, for teaching, L1 or, teach, or teaching L2. So we provide uh, the teacher training, uh, the, the, the uh, pre-service uh, training, and also we also have the kind of uh, in-service training uh, for them from time to time. So that's for teacher training. Uh, so uh, would that, is that answer your question? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we may have come to a point where uh, we're in a well-deserved break. Um, the, I, I, a couple of logistics. Uh, we're dismissed until about 3.30. Gives you a lot of time to meet people you have, may have grown interest in as you heard their questions and meet some others. 
there's plenty of materials from the various groups that are represented here uh, outside, and I know they'd like you to take all of those. And I'd like you to join me in thanking our panel for getting our day off to such a good start. We're back here at 325. Okay, welcome back, everyone. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Peter Weinberger. I'm a senior program officer here at the USIP Academy. I'm a colleague uh, with Dr. Lopez, who had to leave to catch a flight uh, overseas for some work that he's doing on behalf of the Institute. Um, I'd like to say a bit about what I do at the Institute, because it will frame some of the questions I have for our, our colleagues here on the podium. Um, I deal with a number of courses here at, in the USIP Academy. For those of you who are not familiar with what we do, it is basically a school for professionals. We teach um, diplomats, military officers, people who work for NGOs. We have uh, courses here in this building online, self-paced courses. And we also take our programs overseas internationally to partner with organizations uh, to learn from their expertise. I have a broad portfolio here at the Institute, but I'm especially interested in everything that's being discussed today because I deal with a lot of issues relating to language, identity, and culture. One of the things that I encounter a lot, particularly when I train American international affairs professionals who are going to uh, work in uh, an international context, is someone who will say to me things like, I'm there to do a very specific task. I'm there to help reconstruct the, the school system or to help uh, promote uh, the rule of law or to actually build the physical infrastructure. And things like identity, language, culture are less important for me, and I don't see how that will affect my work. <laughs> my reaction is usually the same as what all of you are doing. I have to suppress a smile and say um, that if one is not mindful of, of things related to language, identity, and culture, one will be terribly blindsided. And in order to be effective uh, to work with partners internationally, one certainly has to understand their history, their historical narratives, and certainly make an effort to learn their language. Um, I would say that uh, one of the great successes of the United States Institute of Peace uh, is our partnerships with uh, non-governmental organizations and educational uh, institutes uh, internationally. It's through them that we learn best practices, and we're actually able to serve as a conduit to share information. So in this capacity, for me, uh, it's just a treasure to be here today to listen to colleagues. Our next panel will be talking about some best practices that are being done on the grassroots levels, sort of zooming in, if you will, from the perspective of we had sort of a, a macro perspective. Now we have more of a, a micro perspective. Um, we have uh, four distinguished panelists. First will be uh, Joel Trudell. Following him will be Union Samo, following him will be Cecilia Ochoa, and finally will be Mikhail Olson. I ask each of the panelists to speak uh, briefly to present their papers, and afterwards we'll have a facilitated uh, Q&A, which I will uh, return to the stage to do. Thanks. Please, Joel. Thank you for the opportunity. Good morning. Good, morning. Good afternoon. Um, I've been living in Nairobi for the last 20 years, working with SIL International. My area of interest uh, for research has been literacy, especially literacy in African societies. But for the last three years, I've been accompanying the Kenya Peace Network. And that, is, that experience with the Kenya Peace Network is what I'm going to share on this morning. Kenya Peace Network is a network of 15 Kenyan organizations that come around together to, to share and to get support for their activities in peace. And it's a wide range of activities. Some of them are relating to family violence situations. Some of them work, working with uh, commercial sex workers and their orphans. Some of them are working with inter-ethnic conflict and reconciliation. A number of them are working with sharing and explaining and uh, communicating the new constitution, the rights that are associated with the new constitution. I don't know if you know the background of the constitution in Kenya, but in uh, 2007, 2008, there was an election uh, that was too close to call. It provoked some election violence 
that was widespread throughout the country. Over a thousand people were killed. Uh, several hundred thousand were displaced. Much of it was along ethnic lines. Kofi Annan came in to help with the reconciliation process. And part of the reconciliation process was the uh, form, forming, forming the process that would form a new constitution. And so these organizations, several of them were involved in, in, in letting people know what was involved, what their rights were, what, the, what were the particulars of the new constitution as a part of a peacemaking process. So these 15 organizations came come together to, to, as a network periodically to discuss their issues and to get support and funding for their own issues. Um, I'd like to say there was some profound linguistic aspect of their coming together. Um, it's harder, I mean, the thing that comes out to me is a very messy linguistic situation. Some of the agencies are working in local rural areas and they're using the local Kenyan languages. Others are urban, have urban activities and they're using Kiswahili or English for their, their the medium for their activities. So there's a, a, a variety of languages and a variety of perspectives on the importance of language in each of these organizations. Maybe I can illustrate through my involvement um, some of the messiness and what came out of um, the monitoring and evaluation exercise that I conducted with a team with this organization, with the network. Um, we did an exercise in what's called most significant change, which is the collecting of narratives of change from the beneficiaries of the organizations. And so uh, 10 of the organizations participated in this organization, in this exercise, and we trained two people from each organization to go out and collect narratives of change. The question being to the beneficiaries, what changed as the result of our activities in the past year? We did it last year, so it was 2012's activities. And so these narratives were collected from all 10 organizations. They went out and they collected 17, I'm sorry, 75 narratives of what had changed in each of their contexts from the perspective of the beneficiaries. So those 75 narr narratives were collected and, and processed. And we encouraged each organization to, as a staff, uh, discuss which of those n narratives in their own, that, they, that their own organization collected was the most significant and why, what made it significant. And so there was a process of their own values of staff of what did they think was going on when they collected these narratives from the beneficiaries. And so each of those 10 organizations submitted 10 stories that they thought these are the most significant. And so we printed up those stories. We got the directors of all those organizations together and we had them read all the stories together. And at first we just debriefed and said, what did you learn through this exercise about what your beneficiaries think? But then as a, as a network, we got together and we said, which of these 10 stories best embodies the values of our network? Which of these 10 stories that each of your organizations submitted best embodies what we think the Kenya Peace Network is about? So as you can imagine, it was a very lively discussion because some of them identified very much with the stories that came from their organization. And so there's a lot of back and forth about, well, which, and we went through a ranking process, a discussion process, and it was, it was very instructive for all of them. At the end, they came up with you know, the higher ranked stories. And the, the, the story that was ranked the highest was one about inter-ethnic conflict. It was set in the north of Kenya, near Marsabit, an area that it, where pastoralists are, are operating, where um, there's been uh, conflict that has been going on for some time. It goes back uh, to... Uh, water rights, pastoral rights. Um, but more recently, these same ethnic groups, the Barana, the Gabra, the Randeli, these are the names of these ethnic groups, um, where they used to settle their conflicts with bows and arrows. Now they're settling them with automatic weapons. And so entire villages were being wiped out. And then in retaliation, another village would be wiped out. And so the, the escalation of the violence was significant. And so there was an, one of the organizations was working in this area to try to deal with 
the reconciliation issues that they saw as necessary to, to bring peace to the area. And so the story of the beneficiary was one Gabra man, a young man, married man, who had lost a number of his cousins to the violence, a number of his friends he'd lost. And he was willing to participate in this training. And it was a kind of a training of reflection leading to action. And as a result of the training, he began to invite people from other ethnic groups into activities that they had in common in, in, in the community. He began to see them and participate, encourage them to participate across ethnic lines to the point where he said, you know, I used to think of all of the Gabra as thieves and liars. I used to think of them as, as, as the, the, the enemy. And now as a result, I'm thinking, you know, I need to change my attitude. It has to start with me. Peace has to start with me. And so this was the narrative that they had selected as being the one that they felt most embodied the values of their, of their network. And one of the reasons was it was a story of personal change, that an individual who had participated in the training changed personally. But it was also a story of social change because his activities had been to invite other groups to get together to be involved socially. So there was social change as well. Now, what can we say about this linguistically? Well, the linguistics, the language, the identity, the competition for resources, the politicians that stirred all that up, they conspired to create the situation in the first place. And afterwards, those things still exist. But what the story uh, exemplifies is that change can happen even if you, don't, you have the same situation on one side or the other. I like the, the, what Patricia Friedrich said earlier. Turning around people's views, I think one of the aspects of this intervention was an attempt to change people's minds, to turn around their views in the situation, even though the situation itself, from the, from the beginning of the intervention, intervention to the end of, end of the intervention, still the, 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 the dynamics that were pushing people towards conflict still exist. But the efforts that they were making to turn around people's views, I think, with is one of the things that they felt made it um, exemplified the kinds of interventions that, that the network was trying to highlight. So I offer that as one of the, the aspects of, of sort of uh, on the ground uh, peace, peace efforts that I've been involved in in Kenya. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start talking, I would like to say I'm so sorry for my English because it's the fourth language for me. <laughs> <laughs> my mother tongue is Thai Malay. The second language is uh, Thai. The third language is Standard Malay. So, okay. I would like to talking about the identity through the lens of language and script in Thailand Deep South. The Tani Malay situation, it's about 83% of people in the three southernmost provinces, or more than a million people speak Tani Malay. But Tani Malay plays an important role. It's used in everyday communication. We use it in Islamic teaching, entertainment, and radio and television. But until recently, Tani Malay was not permitted to be spoken by teachers or students in government schools. At present, Batani Malay language and culture are declining. Some younger generation do not speak Batani Malay. A Creole language between Batani Malay and Thai is developing in the urban areas. The oral literature is dying, such as games, stories, and tales, poems, and songs, and so on. And the last one, the chronic underachievement in school. For Tani Malay, students have a lower score in the national testing. It's about 40% illiterate at 
grade 3. Here is the languages used in the area. The number one is, is Patani Malay. The second one is mi mixed language between Patani Malay and Thai. The third one is Standard Thai. The fourth one is Southern Thai and Standard Malay. And the last one, Arabic. Is the complexity of languages in my areas. Here is the language situation survey carried out in 2007. And the result confirmed that Patani Malay is the most widely used in daily life. And it's also the language that people in the area have confidence in their ability to use. And the Patani Malay, also the language which children know best when they start school. And also it's the language that the people prefer to use in education. In this slide, I will talking about the three scripts that's being used in the area. The number one is Jawi, which is Arabic-based script. It's used for writing a kind of classical Malay, not Patani Malay. It is widely used in Islamic domain, in Islamic religious texts. It's most people see it as the identity. And young people do not read and write Jawi proficiently. The second one is Rumi, which is Romanized script. It's only popular among people educated in Malaysia, Indonesia, or Brunei. The third one is Thai script. More people in the area have literacy skills in Thai than any other language. The Thai script used to write Patani Malay in non-formal education and in Patani Malay lessons for Thai government officials or as a tool for documentation of cultural texts which cannot be written in Javi or Rumi. Here is the example of the signs in, in, my, in my area. In this, here is the semester sign, which provided three scripts. Here is the Jawi script. We also have a Rumi script here, and also thai script. It is very common in the area that we have a difference. We have a variety of script on signs along the street, along the community, and so on. Yes, I will skip the, this slide. Okay. This slide just to show you about the complexity, the, the multiple identities of Patani Malay speaker in Thailand's deep south. They have their own mother tongue at the local at the local level. And they also have a Thai language and they also need to be a part of Thai nation at the national level. At the same time, they also have an Islamic world, which is related to the classical Malay, which is used the Jawi script. And the last one, the people in the area also have a larger Malay world, which is related to the standard Malay written in Rumi script. Here is the complexity of the people in the area. They have to learn more languages. They have to learn Patani Malay. They have to learn Thai. They have to learn classical Malay written in Jawi, and also they have to learn standard Malay in the larger society. Patani Malay Thai based script is selected as a foundation for the Patani Malay Thai bilingual education. What is the advantage of using Patani Malay Thai based script? Patani Malay Thai based script is necessary for pedagogical and political reasons because it can exactly represent local pronunciation. It is easy to learn because most people in the area are familiar with the Thai script from school. It can be used to record local wisdom and knowledge. 
It helps develop the student's cognitive skill and facilitate easy transition to Thai. And the last one, it is accepted by the government agencies and society at large. But some people underestimate the values of a tiny Malay Thai-based script. A handful of influential local figures feel that Thai-based Tani Malay script is another Thai government assimilation strategy to destroy the Jawi script. And some people do not understand the importance of the mother tongue or find it hard to accept the use of the local language in education. Some people feel that the classical Malay written in Jawi is superior to the everyday spoken Tani Malay. And the last one, some people think standard Malay is superior to Patani Malay. How does the Patani Malay Thai bilingual education promote all this script? As Ajahn Suwilai mentioned before, in our, MI, in our program, we start with the Patani Malay, which is the mother tongue at the, be at the beginning of school. And then, we gradually bridge to Thai language at the second semester of KG1 and also introduce the literacy in Patani Malay in KG2 and continue the oral Thai. And then for the Jawi script, we introduce in grade 3. And for the Rumi script, or standard Malay we introduced in grade 4. So the people, uh, after they, they finish grade 3, a uh, grade 6, so our children can speak, can, can listen in speaking, reading, and writing in four languages. They are Patani Malay, Thai, Rumi, and Ajawi and Rumi. Here are some pictures, the achievement of the, our student. They can read and write in Thai based Patani Malay. They also can read and write in Jawi here. And also Rumi. Quality education that honors the Patani Malay identity can enhance human security and help build peace. Patani Malay Thai bilingual education can contribute to security and peace. Children and children or students will have will su success in school and have more opportunity in jobs and more opportunity in higher education, and also they can keep their language and culture identity. For the parents and community, they will they satisfy with their children's achievement. They have more confidence in the Thai government school, and they trust in Thai education policy, and also it will fulfill their needs keep all their identity. For the Thai society, they will see the values of the diversity and multilingualism in this country. And also, they can see the importance of education for national reconciliation. And they also accept the ethnic language and culture identity in the country. Yes, thank you very much. and I'm from Save the Children, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us to present um, today. I am a recent transplant to D.C. from the Philippines, so in my mother tongue, maligayang pandaigdigang araw ng wikang sarili. So uh, while we're waiting for um, the slides to come on, um, 
the talk I'm going to give right now is really a little bit more um, skewed towards why equity in education, equity in educational outcomes is very critical to longer lasting peace. And I'm so glad that a lot of the presenters earlier um, had pointed to the, the importance of structural causes behind conflict and why we need to be addressing um, those possible causes of conflict, um, preventing those possible causes of conflict. Um, I guess we're waiting for the slide. supposed to end. Oh, there it is, okay. All right. So as I said earlier, this is about how our programs globally um, are working um, within education to bolster children's, the use of children's home language in improving educational outcomes. Um, so a lot of the speakers earlier had already pointed out the importance of, of um, education as the potential and its potential for supporting um, peace, but there's also, it's a double-edged sword, right? So if uh, it can be both a, a contributor to peace building and it can also aggravate conflict. And um, uh, many of the practitioners earlier have already stated the, um, the various aspects um, in terms of tolerance, inclusiveness, and why uh, incorporating a, a, a positive language policy is important. But we also need to be thinking about the potential of language um, in terms of how it can contribute to more effective outcomes for learning for children. And that's absolutely um, fundamental. If, as we were saying earlier, this is an increasingly multiliterate world, and without giving children a strong foundation in the basics of literacy, they will, there will be an increasing language divide and literacy divide globally. So we need to be looking at learning equity as well um, in our work globally. And why do we know that learning is an issue and learning equity is an issue. Several reports have pointed out to this disparity. Um, the most recent Education for All report alerted us to a global learning crisis. Um, there are wide gaps and disparities in learning outcomes and going forward after the 2015 uh, Millennium Development Goals are passed, all of us are now looking critically at how um, disparity, addressing disparity and addressing inequity will need to be sort of the focal point for, um, for development goals moving forward. And language, specifically children's inability to understand the language of instruction, um, will be a huge factor behind why they struggle to learn and has been proven to be a huge factor behind why they struggle to learn. Um, so I just wanted to, sh I asked my friend to quickly draw this graphic up. Um, so we're not, we're not talking about equality and opportunities. We want to emphasize that to be able to address language issues in learning, we have to be looking at the equity question. In Washington, D.C., right now, equity is very sexy, right? Um, and because of the 1% and everything else. But globally, we also need to be looking at, at equity in learning. And um, I thought this graphic was really a good representation of why we need to differentiate between equality and equity. And there's a really good quote there by um, Pauline Rose. Um, it's not, th there are many populations who are struggling the most who are at the mar margins, including ethnic minorities, girls, those who are impoverished um, in terms of home literacy environments and everything else. And we need to be looking at um, equity in a different light. We need to be showing that there need to, needs to be special effort extended for those groups that are struggling the most. And it's not just providing equal opportunity, but really providing the boost that they need to be able to, to um, achieve equality in, in learning outcomes. And we also know from our work globally in Save the Children that um, children who are coming from language minority groups are struggling. Um, we did um, baseline studies in a variety of countries. For example, in Nepal, where we, would, we did um, a school effectiveness um, study, we saw, we saw that non-native speakers of the language of instruction were significantly disadvantaged in terms of their learning outcomes. Um, and the Nepali speakers were able to um, sustain that advantage, right? So we need to be addressing um, the needs of, of those who are struggling the most with, with language and education. There's a similar situation in my home country in the Philippines. This was a study that we did in both urban sites in Metro Manila as well as in Mindanao. Um, the Philippines is a country where there's 171, 180, depending on who you talk to, 
languages, um, and um, the privilege that's being provided to children who are able to speak the language of instruction is really um, exacerbating the gaps between um, learning outcomes for many children. And a similar situation was found in um, ethnic minority um, communities in Vietnam, where we were also doing a lot of mother tongue language education work, um, where the kin speakers, uh, uh, predominantly the dominant language speakers, are um, particularly advantaged by their um, by the fact that they speak the language of instruction. So knowing that these issues exist um, in education, um, what has been Save the Children's response? Um, I think it's important that we not just focus on school, but we also be look. We also need to be looking at the earliest stages. And I see Emily here. Hi, Emily, uh, who's a, both a mother tongue advocate and an ECCD um, advocate. Um, a lot of parents who are coming from the non-dominant language group do not see their skills, their own vocabulary, as resources, but they absolutely are. And so we need to be emphasizing to parents that early stimulation, parent-child interactions, just speaking to your children, um, aiding them in um, knowing what the different labels are for different things, those are absolutely critical for children's knowledge um, and for their learning and cognitive development. We are also doing, apart from our zero to three work, we're also doing a lot of work with community-based preschools um, or alternative um, opportunities for children to learn. And within those opportunities, we are beginning to address um, the use of mother tongue for emergent literacy and math activities. So it's absolutely fundamental that we also be looking at the early childhood stages because actually that's, um, that's an area where government is very loose in terms of language policy, right? They're, they're not as, as um, agitated about language policy when it's in, it's in those critical um, early stages. And in basic education, we're also um, promoting a program called Literacy Boost. Uh, we combine assessment, teacher training, and community action. And again, the emphasis here is we need to be looking at it holistically and not just looking at the school or the classroom. Um, children bring a lot of resources into the classroom, and, we meet, and the community also brings a lot of resources. So we need to be looking at various aspects of the, the, the environment that surrounds children, the language and literacy environment that surrounds children. So what we do is um, we provide reading materials in both the mother tongue and the language of instruction, and we um, expand children's exposure to that, to that particular um, field of literacy. Um, in, cer in certain contexts, there are not a lot of materials available in the mother tongue, and we work with partners like SIL or other organizations to produce those materials. We train teachers on expli ex explicit reading instruction strategies, and we also have in our teacher training a specific session on why language matters and why they need to be um, understanding what language resources their children bring to the classroom. And then finally, we have a lot of opportunities at the community level and at the home level to engage children in um, literacy practice that's interesting and fun. There's a lot of talk earlier about motivation, and absolutely motivation will be critical if you want to sustain a culture of literacy and a culture of interest in language um, throughout children's lives. Our results thus far, um, we've seen that our ECCD programs are helping. Children who have access to ECD programs in Indonesia typically outpace those who do not have access to ECD. And in our Bangladesh program, where we did a study of our emergent literacy and math program, we saw that um, those interventions um, allow the children to outperform those kids in the control schools. And in Literacy Boost, which is now um, operational in about 20 countries worldwide, we did cross-country analysis of our results. And we're seeing that um, these efforts to integrate language and literacy skills are working. Um, so in, in our cross-country study, we saw, we saw significant effects across different countries on the different um, um, components of reading development. And we also see that in the most fundamental um, aspect of reading and literacy, which is comprehension, we're able to move um, the needle forward, not as fast as we would like, but we're able to move the needle forward in terms of um, strengthening children's comprehension uh, skills in terms of literacy development. Um, so uh, as a final call to action, it's uh, I just wanted to, um, sort of to underscore why language matters in children's learning. We need to increase the amount of interventions that we have, and we need to go beyond the traditional interventions that just focus on teachers and classrooms and textbooks and look at what children are bringing from their home environments and in their communities to support children's literacy. And uh, if we're ever going to be fulfilling the potential of education to serve as a peace building instrument, we absolutely need to be focused on equity and language as a significant aspect of. Thank you.
I'm going to use the podium as a prop here to keep me awake. I've actually <laughs> started this day uh, many hours ago in the north of Uganda, traveled eight hours to uh, Kampala. <laughs> Then caught a plane to uh, Addis and then to Rome and then arrived here this morning. So it's been a long day. <laughs> uh, I want to explore with you uh, some thoughts we've been having at World Vision. My name is Mikhail Olson. I'm the Global Technical Director for Education and Life Skills there. And uh, we're sort of new in the game in terms of improving teaching and learning. We've done a lot with... Uh, hardware around building schools and, and uh, supplies and scholarships and things like that. So we're trying to incorporate best practice models around the core things of, of a basic education, which have been defined in the Dakar goals as functional levels of reading, math, and essential life skills. And I'm finding it particularly interesting around the essential life skills and those that contribute to, to peace and active citizenship participation. Uh, in that in, when we're working with ethno-linguistic minorities, a lot of the strengths around some of these life skills are inherent in their language and cultures and in their traditions and exchanges. And uh, it's kind of a question of who's going to teach who. And do we want to bring best practices, or to what degree do we want to draw out nascent traditional knowledge that's embedded in these cultures. So um, I'm going to read some of these paragraphs so I stay on track. Uh, the basic thesis is that locked within the languages of ethno-linguistic minorities lie excellent tools that can be harnessed to improve quality basic, basic education for many marginalized children, while at the same time building peaceful coexistence and active citizenship capacities uh, among that, the new generation as well as with their parents. Um, many ethno-linguistic minorities encode the world in collective terms, where each individual's identity is largely a function of one's ability to use their talents and strengths for the wider good. That's so emphasized in, in some cultures. I remember LaDonna Harris, who I used to work for at Americans for Indian Opportunity, and she was very fond of saying that, that uh, many Comanche individuals, if they couldn't find how they can use their talents and skills for the wider good, they would actually go crazy. Their identity is so attached to being part of a larger whole and contributing in that way. And uh, I lived amongst the Bari in Papua New Guinea for a number of years and, and learned there that they may commit suicide if for some reason in, in public the wider polit body politic would turn on them uh, with some kind of public defame. Basically because there's no way to escape. You can't run to the next town. You are so tied. Your identity is so much a part of the unit that if it turns on you, you can't, you know, there's no, no alternative. Uh, I say that just, just to say learning to live in relationship, in community, and in harmony with the environment is so strong, not necessarily to the degree that we all want to go to, but so strong in these in, uh, many traditional cultures that they probably have more things to teach us about what it means to live collectively in community and relationship then, then we might want to teach them in terms of these parts of essential life skills. Um, Western worldviews, I think, on the other hand, Western or contemporary society, frequently promote personal autonomy and uh, exploitation of the environment, sometimes at the expense of uh, of the collective good. Um, and I mentioned earlier that the, the Carr Convention where the global development community gathered at the turn of the millennium defined the heart of the basic education and the right of every child as opportunity to acquire at least at a minimum functional levels of reading, 
uh, essential mathematic computation skills, and then a few core uh, essential life skills. It's become powerfully clear, I think, due in part to the devastation of the HIV and AIDS pandemic, that education, if it is to prepare children for productive and fulfilling lives, is just as dependent on children learning essential social skills as it is on children learning the more cognitive reading, writing, and math skills upon which much of schooling in these contexts has been based. So in regard to these essential life skills, in 2002, WHO, UNICEF, and many of the larger NGOs working in the field agreed upon uh, three core categories of essential life skills as those that are fundamental to a basic education and should be, uh, should be taught or processes for acquiring those skills should be promoted as part of every education uh, learning program. Those are critical thinking, emotional management, and self-expression. About the same time, in many indigenous, uh, well, let's say amongst the scholars of indigenous communities, they were also talking about essential life skills, but from a different perspective. Whereas the UNICEF and WHO skills are, are looking at the individual's abilities and skills, uh, the indigenous perspective that was coming out in works like those of LaDonna Harris that I referred to, she did a monograph on uh, indigeneity, and, and they're more very much from this collective point of view and from how the individual is part of a larger whole. And so they defined them as uh, Respect, they call them the four R's, respect, uh, relationship, reciprocity, and responsibility. Very social in their nature. Uh, later on, there's been a progression around how we articulate these life skills. And the latest articulation of them by UNICEF incorporates the social skills. Uh, and so they've redefined these sets so that uh, the new sets are uh, the reasoning skills, personal skills, and interpersonal skills, where the personal skills were combined uh, with the emotional management and the interpersonal skills were combined with the self-expression. But I think the point here that, I'm, that I'd like to make is that uh, what is key is that Social linguistic minorities using multilingual approaches to basic education have at their disposal language resources that clearly encode well-established, easily understood vocabulary, basic thought processes and patterns, and illustrative examples from, from uh, ceremonies and traditions and patterns in their societies for teaching essential life skills that are needed uh, for rebuilding a culture of peace in many of the places uh, where we're doing education with ethno-linguistic minorities. Let me also mention that it's been UNESCO that has given the most attention to peace building as a focus area for the acquisition of essential life skills. And uh, that was captured very eloquently by Margaret Sinclair in her 2008 publication, uh, which you might be familiar with, called Learning to Live Together. And here, peace and active citizenship are elevated as widely recognized life skill goals for the education for all movement overall. As I said earlier, I just returned this morning from what was a project design workshop um, with school management committee heads and PTA heads um, from schools at the Abare and Aboke uh, sub-counties there in uh, northern Uganda, just south of the uh, South Sudan border. And it's really the atrocities that these communities have suffered during the 20 years of clashes between uh, the Lord's Army and the uh, government forces there. 
as published the now infamous book, The Abair Girls. We were actually in the Abair School with those teachers and those SMCs uh, for this workshop. And, and it's that experience that is really driving these local leaders to, uh, to take an active role themselves in participating, improving reading, but reading using the context of their traditional lango, culture, and society uh, to reinforce these essential life skills that have been re eroded in uh, the current generation. And so they're capitalizing on the rich linguistic and conceptual framework that, that the lango language provides for doing this so that even initial literacy and, and early grade reading reinforce at an early age what learning to live together, as Margaret captures it, uh, can mean in preparing them to go on to lead both productive and fulfilling lives. My own uh, early research work was on the language and culture uh, among the Barai on the Monoglos Plateau in Papua New Guinea. And uh, it was just so apparent to me after a couple of years living and working in those communities uh, how intimately the social skills uh, are woven into the fabric of, of, of mother tongue languages and what an amazing untapped resource is readily available for improving basic education, uh, including uh, life skills instruction and how that's encoded and using those stories and tales to, to uh, improve reading outcomes um, because of that language and that knowledge and, and those traditions being so strong. Um, you can, you, by using the encoding of those life skills, you're not only teaching the life skills to the kids, but that frame of reference that they've heard from moms and dads and grandmas and aunties improves comprehension as well. A couple examples about uh, linking um, traditional cultural practices to life skills learning. One of the things amongst the Bari they do is reserve the richest veins of volcanic ash soil uh, that produce the very best of the yams for the in-laws, the in-laws that were drawn into the society from their traditional enemies, their exogamous cultures. So part of the peace building mechanisms in their society is this uh, marrying uh, the traditional enemy and then building strong, close ties through, uh, through those marital relationships. Another thing that Another interesting practice is, is substituting aggressive intertribal impulses with competitive demonstrations of giving more and better gifts uh, than they've ever received from the other side before. And it's the same sort of aggression, but it's about giving more and better and bigger. Um, and a further sign of respect, and I think this is probably true in many traditional societies, is, is uh, that these former enemies now come in-laws. You refrain from using their names as terms of reference, but repeatedly affirm the relationship and what it encodes by using a kin term with an affectionate uh, uh, affix at the end of it so that you're affirming that new relationship with this former enemy repeatedly whenever you want to, to call their name instead of calling their name. And the list goes on. There's just multiple things. Uh, a variety of institutionalized ceremonies like, you know, the breaking of the spears, offering, even offering orphans to former enemies for adoption. Uh, practice of collectively assuming responsibility for the wrongs of one of your own group. So the whole group comes and takes responsibility uh, if, if a wrong has been made rather than just the individual to ensure that living in relationship and living in community uh, transcend differences that arise 
around larger land use, economic uh, issues, or, or even cultural religion issues that may arrive between the different groups. So I say all that just to reiterate again that, that these basic underlying skills about living in relationship, living in community, and living in harmony with the environment can readily be taught and uh, using local languages as, as resources much better than trying to bring in best practices externally. Um, in conclusion, rather than viewing indigenous languages as the source of division and conflict that become barriers to development, let us take advantage of the rich social structure and in indigenous languages uh, and what they encode to provide strong platform for building the core life skills so essential for peaceful coexistence. Thank you. I'd like to thank the, the panelists. Those were really outstanding presentations and a lot of fascinating and rich material. I'd just like to take uh, just two or three minutes to comment it on uh, what I heard from my perspective as a practitioner here at the Institute of Peace. And one of the things that stood out from all four of the presentations was just so much of a convergence of the kind of work that um, my colleagues and I do here, and particularly the way that we think about framing how to uh, deal with different peoples and how to think about um, what is a substantive and rich peace. Um, when I was listening to uh, uh, Joel Trudell, the, um, the convergence was extremely close because we're interested as, in well in, as using uh, qualitative methodologies to gauge um, how effective interventions can be. And in particular, you were talking about this called the most significant change methodology. For those of you who don't know, uh, it's basically asking people um, uh, to, to give uh, in a series of interviews to give narratives or stories about how their lives have changed, how an intervention or uh, an addition of something new has impacted their life. Um, and um, for us, that's extremely important because we want to know uh, what does a, a person, what does a community think peace is? And the only way to do that is to do that, um, well, one, if you uh, intervene or become involved with a community, you have an ethical responsibility to stay involved. You can't just go in and leave. But also, it's important to see um, how, what a sustained impact is and what people think it is. So when I hear you talking about constitution making in Kenya, that, that, really, that really stuck with me. Uh, when I was listening uh, to the uh, presentation by Union Samo, um, I was uh, really interested um, to learn about uh, Patani Malay language and its role in um, uh, people's identity, but also because one of the things that I've observed in our role in uh, peace building, and we use peace building as one word, not two, it's basically a collation of best practices, is that um, oftentimes one of the ways to build effective peace in divided societies is really to focus on people's overlapping identities. And one of the ways that we can focus on people's overlapping identities is particularly their language or linguistic culture. We appeal to other things, whether or not people might have a shared culture of, of womanhood, a, a shared culture of motherhood. For example, people might have a shared identity as, as grieving relatives if they're coming from differing groups. But one of the things where people have commonalities is their language. They might have a different script, they, but they might have a common script, and it's a point of convergence. And that's a way to bring people together and focus on uh, commonalities and differences and say that they can coexist. And it's the way to begin a discussion. I've seen this done in many other parts of the world. So when I heard you talking about that, it really, it really spoke to me, and I found it really interesting. Uh, Cecilia Ochoa, um, I totally agree, and my colleagues and I totally agree, that equity in educational outcomes is crucial, crucial to equitable peace. Um, and it's also true that education is a double-edged sword. It can contribute to peace or aggravate conflict, particularly if people want to promote a particular narrative of history or a particular version of history or promote a particular language or dialect which causes tension. But one of the things that I have found uh, in many parts of the world where I've been working with uh, uh, partnering with local organizations is that a key aspect of peace building is what we call reframing. 
not necessarily rebranding, coming up with a new name for something, but reframing, fundamentally uh, coming up with a new understanding to explain something in a way that appeals to people and speaks to their worldview, but is a small uh, introduction of change, but enough to shift the discussion away. And education is often the best platform to do that. So I, I totally agree. And finally, uh, Mikhail Olson, thank you for not falling asleep on your feet. Uh, I, think, uh, I, I, I commend you. Um, one of the most challenging things that I have to face in my work is to uh, travel internationally and then give a presentation when I'm sleep deprived, so I can really appreciate what you've done. I, uh, I very much uh, uh, took to heart what you said about um, life skills being inherent in ethno-linguistic minorities. And the question is, should we draw them out or try to give them something external? Because a, a lot of things that my colleagues do when they are partnering with communities that have asked for help, and I should say that the Institute of Peace will only go somewhere if we're asked for help, and if we're asked to leave, we will. But one of the, the first things that my colleagues always do is a best practice and say, what traditionally has your community done? What resources, what practices does your community do? How can we uh, inform you about practices elsewhere that might enrich this? So it really very much uh, seemed to resonate with what you were saying. And, uh, and for me, as someone who uh, works in this field but knows less about uh, your profession oh, um, application, particularly linguistics, it was really uh, exciting and uh, affirming to hear ab about this. I'd like to now uh, take uh, several questions from the audience. Uh, I, um, I think I'd like to follow the precedent started by uh, my colleague George Lopez and take several questions at once. Um, I'd also say when you do come up, uh, please introduce yourself and say what organization uh, you may re be representing. Please, ma'am. I am Marilyn C. Faulkner, and I'm a professor of language at Howard University. I would like to have uh, some of the panel's thoughts about the handling of language in the aftermath of the earthquake in Haiti. Uh, the vast majority of the people in Haiti, I would say between 80% and 90% of them, speak Haitian Creole. Yet, uh, most of the international um, help and most of the international uh, meetings uh, that took place, the conferences, were held in uh, either French or English. There was no international conference uh, that provided uh, Haitian Creole interpretation. Uh, the uh, donor community was extremely uh, helpful, and they were the, the Haitians themselves were very uh, grateful for this help. But there was one component that was really uh, missing, and that was a language component. So I would like to, this is not a, a situation of uh, peace <laughs> or conflict, but it's a situation of emergency. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know what your thoughts are into, uh, as far as advising uh, the donor community to really put some effort to uh, reach out to the people. When you speak Creole, Haitian Creole as I do, and you talk to the people on the street, they, they, there is a sense that a lot of what happened in the aftermath of the earthquake sort of uh, went over their head or bypassed them simply because of the language barrier. Thank you. Um, yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> I should say um, I don't have the good excuse that Mikhail does, but I am a new father, and I've been up <laughs> since the wee hours of the morning. That's uh, just as good. Uh, 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 next question, please. Madam. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sarah McVeigh. I'm here today on behalf of the Linguistic Society of America, but I'm also an undergraduate linguistics student at the University of Maryland and a researcher with a project on children's language learning under Dr. Jeffrey Lids. And so I come to this sort of um, as a language scientist and as a syntactician and someone who does some really 
um, different things, and it's such a blessing to be here with such a beautiful group of uh, people from different backgrounds. And so my question, and just hoping to elicit some thoughts about how people like me, graduating undergraduate students, can um, find opportunities in peace building and um, cultural work because sometimes it feels like we're not slotted for opportunities like this or encouraged to pursue things like this. And then secondly, um, on the same line, as a researcher and a linguist, um, how we can encourage people in academia to think more about and take up an interest in peace building and the types of things that we've been talking about today um, and having more conversations about that um, as, as professors and as researchers and as students in institutions. Thank you. Great question, thank you. Uh, and please, you in the back row, yes. Um, my name's Ellen Street and I'm coming to you from the University of Missouri. Um, my question is inspired by Patali Malay. Um, so uh, it seems to me, from what I understand, is that Batali Malay was standardized, and so that's why it represents the local pronunciation. Um, just as learning in a non-native language is detrimental to adolescents, um, in languages where standardization doesn't reflect the local dialect, um, do learners that speak drastically different dialects produce the same results? Any additional questions at this point? All right. Um, well, then I will um, let the panelists uh, um, address these three questions. Um, do I have someone to begin about the issue with Haitian Creole and uh, the intervention after the uh, earthquake? I'll be happy to talk about that. My goodness. I, I feel very strongly about uh, about development being a dialogic path where we collaborate together and we find the best way forward by pooling our ideas and our insights. So uh, I don't think there's a solution to any serious development problem without structuring the dialogue in a way that all perspectives are really being heard. So um, I deliberately make an attempt to physically structure a process so who speaks when uh, is coordinated and it, it becomes a multi-lingual uh, context. If, if a perspective needs to is best pers uh, expressed in another language, there should be a mechanism for either translating that or, or if these are opinions that are being considered and weighed up, actually putting them on paper and putting them on the wall so they're treated seriously and considered, but there's ways of structuring the process, whatever planning process or dialogue is going on so that all parties are heard and can speak in the language they're most comfortable with. It's unacceptable, I think, that we bypass that. Um, um, on the Haiti question, I absolutely agree that it needed to be a central piece of the response. But Save the Children has actually been working in Haiti for probably about 30 or 40 years. And in our development work, we found that we needed to convince parents about the importance of Creole, right? Because a lot of the schools there are, um, are using um, French or English for their instruction. And we needed to convince parents about programs that we are doing, like like Save Lavni, which builds on um, Creole as a foundation for literacy. So. Um, I think there's also an aspect of it where we also need to shore up the importance and credibility of Creole as a language among the community members themselves so that it becomes something that's also important for, for governments to, to be engaging with. Gentlemen, do you want to weigh in or stop it? I would say that um, from my perspective here at, at, at USIP, um, we have sort of best practices uh, for working with interpreters or for having uh, um, uh, working with contracting agencies that can provide interpreters um, or um, training staff to be uh, proficient in languages where we know we're working. But one of the, the salient issues is also sometimes there are almost industries of, of local NGOs 
who maintain contact with the international community and um, uh, are well-meaning, but oftentimes it's, it's like a business. And uh, if international community is not really uh, invested in having uh, an impact on the ground and making sure that the aid really goes through all communities is, and is only working with uh, middlemen, it's possible then to become kind of divorced from reality and be able to work in you know, international languages like English and French. And then you see these sorts of things going on. Responsible leadership that's concerned about uh, really helping people and doing no harm will raise issues and will incorporate these into sort of the best practices of an organization. I mean, mistakes are made, but if we see that the same mistakes are repeatedly made, um, then it's because uh, people were negligent. And so I would say you know, that uh, that's the way to avoid that kind of uh, practice from occurring in, in the future. Um, with regard to the, the second question about uh, uh, future careers and getting the academic community um, uh, more involved in kind of a critical awareness of, this, of these issues, I'm wondering if, if any of you would be interested to, to share your perspectives. Um, thus work in both conflict-affected settings, emergency settings, and development settings. And we have opportunities like we have a SAVE University Partnerships for Education Research, where we um, place um, graduate students who are particularly focused on, a, on an area of interest for a country office. Um, so peace building, peace and education, language and education issues might be things that would be coming up as issues from, from countries. So I'd, I'd encourage um, students to, to look at opportunities such as that um, provided by international NGOs. So. Well, I can speak out of my own experiences. Uh, I'm primarily a researcher in ethnography of language and literacy. And as SIL became involved in the issues of, well, we work in the African context where there's um, often the arguments come up um, isn't the diversity of language part of the problem? Isn't that a core, an issue? And we don't believe that to be true. We began to work on literature that would speak to that. But, and we produced some, but in my own case, I began to wonder, well, wonder what the Kenyans think about language diversity and those who are working towards peace, what do they think? And so my, my involvement was a practical involvement of a researcher in, in language getting involved in what was already there. And I guess that, that's the experience I have is that there are many, many organizations that are working towards peace that, do, that people who have skills in literacy or linguistics or research can actually use those skills to serve in other areas. And that's what I was, found myself using my research skills to help them with monitoring and evaluation. So there is an area for people who have literacy and linguistic skills to serve in other areas. I, in my uh, former profession, I was a, uh, a university professor. I was uh, interested to do more practical and applied work, so I, I came to the institute six years ago. Um, but I'd often say to uh, my uh, former students to, to be patient. It takes time. Um, I think it's probably helpful, if not to relocate to a place like Washington, D.C. Uh, it's easier to find this type of work in a place like D.C., but also uh, to take kind of a stepping stone approach, but also to network amongst your colleagues here um, and really let them know what you're interested in doing. I think also the way we're talking about reframing when it comes to peace, sometimes it's necessary to reframe one when looking for a profession and to see really how the skills you have in linguistics can be applied in a lot of uh, other fields, such as the private sector or you know, uh, targeted areas of working for the government. And about the question about um, standardization of, of uh, a language, I wondered, uh, if you would want to uh, address this issue, given your area of expertise, do you, do you need some uh, assistance? Yeah. Yeah. Would you? Yes, please come up.
uh, I, uh, for the question about the standardizing of the Patani Malay, uh, uh, um, it is based on the Patani, Patani dialect, dialect, which is the main dialect. And uh, uh, other smaller dialects are not very much different uh, uh, from each other. Uh, so there are only vocabulary differences and the system is more or less the same. So the, the whole system is the same. So uh, the stand, the uh, Patani Malay uh, based on the Patani dialect, uh, which has been said that that can use for all other small dialects in uh, uh, for writing, for writing. Would that, is that answer your question? Or? Where is where? Okay. Which way they So Patawi Malay, from what I understand, is a language. Mm -hmm. yes. So um, I'm saying it, when I studied in Spain. Uh, the the language that I was learning, writing down, was not the same as the language that I was hearing. Batali Malay, how you write is the same as how you pronounce. That's what I saw in one of the slides. So if students are speaking one dialect and writing in the standard dialect, do you think that that's detrimental to their learning? Or is that not a big issue? Does that make sense? Uh, this, the, you mean this, uh, the student? Uh, Right in. So um, perhaps if, if they want to say the word um, poder in, in the dialect that I learned, they'd say poder. And they wouldn't write the last, or they would write the last letter, but they wouldn't pronounce it. When, when you're very little, I was just curious as to whether that also affects the way that you learn. Uh, it would make, uh, it would be more difficult. But if they uh, if if they write in uh, exactly the way they they, they speak, that is easier. So for uh, working on a writing system, is this a, a new uh, for developing a new writing system? Uh, the best way is to uh, uh, to 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 use to write in uh, exactly the way uh, the people should pr is pr uh, pronounced. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it's different, you know, the writing and the pronunciation is different. Mm -hmm. It, uh, but is it a systematic, and it's not not too complicated. It's systematic. Uh, that uh, that uh, that should be okay. But it's more difficult than if you have a, a direct correspondence between the pronunciation and the writing system. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, are there any final questions or comments for the panel? All right, well, uh, uh, sorry, please. Hi, um, Don Osborne from Bisharat. I had a quick question for uh, uh, Joel Trudell uh, that uh, perhaps dovetails a bit with the response that you just gave. Um, in the aftermath of the election violence in Kenya, uh, I recall seeing uh, calls in the press, and I, I believe uh, one of the calls was by former President Moy to prohibit uh, broadcasts in any language other than Swahili and English. I think that would go along with the idea that one language unites, or maybe two languages unite, but the other languages, I, I, as I understand, were, being, uh, were seen as being used for propagation of uh, hateful or intolerant or even violent messages. Uh, but it occurred that, that uh, maybe an alternative to that, I mean, I was thinking as I was reading that, not having been to Kenya, uh, that it might make a lot of sense to try to use those very languages in which negative messages were used to uh, convey more positive messages. And the, the question I have really is, uh, 
Are you aware of any effort to do that sort of thing in the media, or has the, the idea that the uh, multi-language broadcasts should be uh, uh, suppressed or, or eliminated? This is a very kind, this is a very hot topic in, in Kenyan society right now. Um, the role of local languages in, in society, the role of whether they can even be used in district offices has come up. And, and the, the background on that is one of the people indicted for in the ICC, the International Criminal Court, was also using FM radio mm -hmm. for local um, hate speech. So that, that, that precedent exists, that, or that practice exists. The question is, where, does, where do you know, rights, human rights, and rights to use their language, and the rights to promote local languages and use them as media for uh, instruction, where, where, you know, where did, where, how do those, um, th those conflicting issues come out? And it's, it's still a hot topic in the, in the press. There, uh, just before I left, uh, friends of mine were, were uh, on a talk, television talk show to promote the use of local languages for children's education. So they were clearly speaking that this, the, the, there's, there are other sides to using media local language in, the, in various media, and they want to make sure that side gets heard, but there is this, the background view that local languages, uh, uh, the diversity of languages actually divisive for nation, nation building is still one of the issues there. And so it's, it's a hot topic. It hasn't been resolved. It, they're still trying to figure out how to, to do that. The problem is, is Many of the people outside of urban areas do not speak English or Kiswahili. And so what are their options? What are their options for communication? What are their options for radio? What are their options for, for children's education? So that, that's one of the things that has to be brought back into the conversation is that there are many people who don't speak languages of wider communication. Are they excluded from media? Are they excluded from children's education? That's of course, you can see I have an opinion on that, but that's one of the challenges is there's this history of use of language for hate, and then there's the desire to see more peaceful use as well. Fascinating point. Any, any further questions for our panelists? Yes, please, ma'am. Hi, Alyssa Vischer from World Hope International. Um, we've talked a lot about early childhood education and how important that is for building language and peace. Um, I'm curious, in light of the fact that parents are so uh, vital to that process, as well as that communities and cultures as a whole um, play a role in holding the answers and the keys to peace, um, what, are, what are the processes of, of adult education, and how important are they in learning, learning and teaching language in order to build peace? So, um, so in our work in early childhood education, we engage deliberately with parents from, from the outset. Um, so we have programs that work from zero to three where parents are, are absolutely the most fundamental influence that a, at, at, uh, a child has. Um, so we do work with them. Um, and we don't see whether they're, not, they're li formally literate or not to be a, a barrier. Because as, as I was saying, our language development is a critical part of a, ch a child's cognitive development. And we need to underscore to parents that their, their own lack of formal literacy needs not be a, may not be a barrier to their being able to engage with children on, on that level. Um, so we do a lot of uh, work with parents to provide them with, um, with messages and activities that they can do with children at home. Um, and then we want to, that to be sustained as they um, bring children um, through the early childhood development cycle and on to, to primary school. So, Community mobilization, parental involvement, that's absolutely fundamental to, to the work that we do because we do want um, uh, to sustain the, the, the ability of the community to be supporting children's development even after organizations such as ours exit from, from the community. That would be the same in World Vision as well. Um, with, with any age group, there's parent awareness building, discussions and input and dialogue uh, around the learning. And in terms of their participation in planning and the sustainability of those programs, it's, in, 
important that uh, they have input and understand the, the background issues that may not immediately be apparent. One other thing that uh, we're contemplating is because of the high rates of functional illiteracy with parents is, is having adult child literacy going on at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, where parents' literacy skills are being improved along with the child, so uh, they can do reinforcing activities in the home that, that both uh, participate in. But we haven't uh, initiated those programs yet. Thank you for your answers. Any, any further questions? All right. Well, with my strained eyes, I see no further hands. And I, I wanted to thank the panelists for coming uh, a long way, for sharing their perspective with us. It was an excellent presentation.